Very good morning, one and all. Respected faculties, Dr. Gita Nachraj, Dr. Motiwala sir, Dr. Sheila Chalwadikar, Dr. Manish Inhamdar, Dr. Anit Papati, Dean of Faculty, Dr. Bagal sir, and two dear students. It is my privilege to welcome you all for this Red to COVID-19 orientation program for final year examination appeared Dental, Ayurveda, Yunani, Homeopathy, BPTH, BOTH, BPO, and BISLP students. Yesterday we had covered about present status of COVID-19 and the
हेलो आई एम ऑडिबल आई एम नॉट गेटिंग द वॉइस बैक आई कैंट हियर यू वी आर एबल टू हियर यू सर थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू मोतीवाला सर गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग डियर डॉक्टर मनीष गुड मॉर्निंग सर डॉक्टर मनीष इनाम दर हियर यस यस वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू यू थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सर थैंक यू लुकिंग फॉरवर्ड टू हियरिंग यू यस सर यस सर थैंक यू थैंक यू from madam good morning very good morning to you sir very good morning let's have a nice session today yes looking forward to it thank you yes sir very good morning dr sridhar we can see your screen very well you have shared your ppt with us uh, you can carry on can you hear me yeah yeah we can hear you yeah. okay so i'll start uh, there was a bit of kind of technical glitch uh, no today yeah so today's topic uh, which i'll be covering is mainly about covid 19 uh, diagnosis and one of the most important aspects of diagnosis is obviously the specimen collection uh, so there is a concept uh, first of all uh, good morning to the students and co faculty so as i was saying there is a concept in any kind of lab diagnosis about garbage in and garbage out so if the sample collection itself is not proper then the possibility of getting a valid result also diminishes significantly so uh, as a golden rule make sure that the specimen collection is proper so that you get the proper results a lot of the results are very much uh, dependent on the quality of the specimen collected so just to brief you up since now you will be a, a part of clinical practice and maybe management of covid patients once you get the results uh, you may be needed to collect the samples and also interpret the covid reports so uh, it was said by the director general uh, dr tedros who that main concept to contain this deadly infection and this pandemic will be test test and test and obviously then treat so uh, as you all know you will have certain kind of suspect cases which you suspect covid 19 in those uh, cases like mainly a upper respiratory tract infection kind of picture with fever in this cases you will go for a uh, uh, lab diagnosis of covid 19 so Yeah, that so that we can successfully isolate the patient in case of positive, and if the patient is a moderate to severe case of COVID nineteen, then we can proceed with the necessary treatment and to take care of the breathlessness. So these are certain definitions in which you will go for a lab diagnosis, and once the lab diagnosis comes as positive, then that is known as a confirmed case of COVID nineteen. so uh, what is the basis of the specimen collection as a general guideline it should be collected as soon as possible you don't wait especially in a symptomatic patient once the physician has decided that this patient needs to be uh, assessed for covid 19 then uh, immediately go for the sample collection whenever the collection is being done the number of healthcare workers should be limited the person who is collecting should uh, compulsorily wear a uh, face shield and an n95 it would be better if uh, uh, the whole ppe kit is used and collect the specimen in a normal procedure room with doors closed and restricted access 
and after the procedure is done you have to clean and disinfect the room with the proper disinfectant 1% sodium hypochlorite is a very good virucidal disinfectant so very important thing is here label each and other specimen each specimen container with the patient's unique id uh write the proper registration number so that there is no kind of mislabeling or misidentification and uh, prefer not to write only the single name of the patient because there are many patients of uh, same name like you you can say rajesh uh, you will have 10 uh, uh, three four patients uh, with the name of rajesh so you need the unique registration number and the date and time when the specimen was collected especially important for a rapid antigen test in which uh, it has to be performed within half an hour of the specimen collection uh, another important point which you might need to do when you start uh, working uh, is to complete the specimen uh, requisition form completely this is very important it uh, creates a lot of hassle for both the physicians as well as the lab performing the test we will discuss this in the further slides uh follow the facilities guidelines wherever you are working follow the lab as well as the clinicians guidelines there so that there is no kind of pro problem follow the sops and strictly adhere to the recommended hand hygiene measures so these are the two swabs you will be mainly using for the diagnosis uh, as you know that oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal or nasal swabs uh, that are the upper respiratory specimens are currently used widespread Uh, for the lab diagnosis you, uh, if a patient is unconscious or on ventilator and all you can use the lower respiratory tract uh, uh, specimens like a bronchial alveolar lavage and all but uh, probably that will be done in an icu setting what mostly you will be doing in the community or in the opd patient is this swabbing so an oropharyngeal swab looks like this and a nasopharyngeal swab looks like this so uh, remember to use the appropriate swab you will get both the swabs with whenever you requisite the test uh, don't use this swab for the nasopharyngeal it will cause uh, discomfort more discomfort to the patient for the nasopharyngeal especially use this thin swab this is as flexible shaft and this is what is known as a viral transport medium so this has a buffer solution inside all this will be provided to you by the lab before performing the collection you need to ensure that you have all the components in place and have worn the necessary protective personal protective equipment so this has a buffer which has antibiotics inside and a buffer which keeps the virus viable and the antibiotics prevent it from the contamination by other bacteria which are generally residing in the throat so once you collect the swab you have to place the swab inside this vi viral transport medium and then you have to break it at this point it breaks off easily and you have to tightly screw the back the lid this is very important to avoid leakage you have to ensure that the lid is tightly screwed in otherwise it uh, leads to leakage and then uh, you will have to recollect the sample so this is what is known as a nasopharyngeal swab uh, which will which is the kind of uh, the best sample the highest sensitivity is uh, for the nasopharyngeal swab uh, so you we will discuss how to perform this make sure that the patient is made comfortable you explain him the pro, him or her the procedure properly so that the patient doesn't get startled and make sure the uh, room is well illuminated you have all the personal protective equipments and then tilt the head back 70 degrees gently and slowly insert the swab uh, with into the nostril parallel okay it has to go parallel to the nostril and not upwards don't do not insert the swab in a upwards direction it might perforate and even reach the brain uh, brain in uh, rare cases so always insert it parallel roughly till about it reaches the uh, ear of the uh patient so that means you, roughly you have reached the nasopharyngeal region then leave the swab and gently roll it for about 10 seconds to absorb whatever secretions are present into the swab and then remove the swab if the swab appears to be dry you can repeat this again from the second nostril till the swab collects enough of secretions but once you remove it from one nostril and the swab has 
enough of secretions visible, then you do not need to uh, repeat from the other nostrils. Sometimes there may be a deviated nasal uh, septum, like in some patients, then you need to collect from the other nost nostril where it is more roomy. And like I said, you have to break the swab uh, at that, there is a point which breaks easily and tightly screw the lid. Again, I, I will emphasize that you have to tightly close the lid because a lot of time we receive the samples in which one sample has leaked and then the whole batch has to be discarded and you, have, you will have to repeat the collection of the whole batch. Second type of collection which you need to do is the oropharyngeal collection. Uh, again, uh, this is a convenient, uh, more convenient than the nasopharyngeal, but the sensitivity is slightly less than a nasopharyngeal. It is ideal to send both the nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swab in the same VTM that will result in a better yield of the virus and uh, the chances of getting a true positive is uh, higher uh, rather than missing out on an infection and getting a false negative. So you have to, again, tell the patient about the procedure. Make sure the room is well illuminated because you have to visualize inside the mouth. Use a tongue depressor and then tell the patient to say verbally, ah, with a loud ah, then only you will be able to visualize the entire area. These are the palatine tonsils. You do not have to touch the tonsils, but rather the oropharyngeal area, which is at the back of the mouth. So patient will have a kind of a gag reflex. Patient will cough. Uh, if a patient is having discomfort, that means it is a proper collection. Even for the nasopharyngeal collection, you will the patient will have some kind of discomfort and tickling sensation in the no nose. That means and may even have tears. So that means it is a proper collection. There will be some kind of discomfort for the patient during the specimen collection. So it's a good idea always to inform that to the patient beforehand. So very important aspect is your specimen requisition form. Many of the times this is where uh, things are lacking the most. Uh, many of the interns uh, fail it or even in your case, if, if, if at all you will be posted in the COVID management after your results, then uh, whenever these things are not filled, it is a problem for both the physicians and the lab both. So please, please send some extra seconds if you want. It hardly takes any minute, any uh, time, but fill this completely. Always fill this completely. You have to note where, and all the star marked fields are mandatory. So all these fields, which have a star or asterisk besides them are mandatory. You have to fill it. If it is not properly filled, the lab may has a right to reject the sample. So read out the instructions. Uh, mark whether the sample has been collected for the first time or not. Complete patient name, that, like I said, with a father's name preferably, but this is the uh, mandatory. Like I said, don't just write the first name like Suresh, Ramesh, Rajesh, there, because there are many patients of the same name. Preferably write the full name. If you can add in the father's name or middle's name, uh, middle name, that is also better. Write the age of the patient, uh, your gender, Occupation, because it uh, there, there are certain decis uh, decisions taken by the lab based on the occupation. Mobile number is very important to trace and track back the patient. Please fill this properly. Do not fake the mobile number. The lab spends uh, much of the time calling up and then uh, the phone number turns out to be fake. Nationality will be Indian in most of the cases. Another uh, uh, field which is faked a lot of times is the present patient address. Do not do this, please. It is a request from my side. Always write the complete proper patient's address, which is true because if at all the patient turns out to be positive, there is actually a team of people which goes to their residence and try, does, does that contact tracing. So many of the times we have seen that people just write fake address and the team goes to that particular area, let's say like the other, and they try to find that building and uh, they cannot find that building. And they, uh, uh, it is a waste of resources, especially in this time where the, uh, both the healthcare workers are stress overburden and the resources are also less. So do not fake addresses, write the complete address with the room number, building uh, name, 
and the uh, area like uh, dadar or ghatkopar or whatever it is district will be uh, whatever it is mumbai mumbai suburban palgar raigarh whatever is your own district bid whatever whatever is the district state will be maharashtra in most of the cases for you uh, pin code Uh, arogya setu app if the patient has or not you have to write that many of the times what we say see is in the address the uh, room number uh, they the they keep the pre filled forms the interns keep a pre filled forms with various fake addresses and just write the patient's name and all uh, which is a very wrong thing and leads to a lot of trouble for both the physician as well as the lab so another new this is the latest form you have to always be updated with the current most referral form by smr they keep on updating it uh, in certain days so this is the water i am showing you is the current latest but it may change in the future so keep an eye for that currently smr is looking out at the breakthrough infections in the vaccinated people so you have to add in the vaccination history of the patient to be tested so that we know that despite vaccination whether the patient came positive after how many doses this is known as breakthrough infections through vaccination next page you will get this details you have to tick where whether it is a throat swab कंटेनमेंट जोन मेडिकल सिम्टम्स एंड साइंस यू कैन इंक्लूड दिस इज ऑल्सो इम्पॉर्टेंट टू मेक सर्टन डिसीजन लैब डिसीजन सो अम्टोमैटिक पेशेंट मे हैव एन अनदर एल्गोरिदम especially for a rapid antigen test and an asymptomatic patient will have a different algorithm to be followed so please make sure you mention the symptoms if any pre existing conditions are there and this is the column which says hospitalization details even if the patient is not hospitalized and only opd just write your name and your phone number so that we can trace from where the patient has come or where the requisition has come lots of the time we get only the patient details and there is no contact number of the doctor so it becomes very difficult for us to resolve any queries or kind of do any kind of uh, uh, follow up of that patient so always write your true phone number this is only for communication between the lab and you and to set some kind of responsibility and uh, accountability it is not nothing to do like threaten you or land up you in tr trouble so please write your whole name and phone number so that we can contact you if any kind of information is required so specimen collection uh, requires uh, personal protective equipments we have discussed this in the previous lecture so i am not going into the details you will need a uh, gloves and uh, n95 respirator and a uh, face gown will is very important because the patient will gag or uh, uh, kind of cough so th they will release the droplets whenever you collect the uh, specimen you have to and transport it to the lab you have to always do triple packaging for most of the uh, tests so the same uh, principle holds to for the covid 19 testing so your viral transport medium container becomes your primary receptacle which contains the swab you uh, place cotton around it that is the absorbent material so if any there is any kind of leakage it will be absorbed and uh, the person handling the box will not get infection put it in a secondary receptacle most of the times it is a zip pouch bag you can put it inside that and a third uh, receptacle this is mo mostly a thermocol box or a vaccine carrier box so this is what we do in our institute you can follow something uh, similar on similar lines this is this is the viral transport medium once the collection is done preferably seal it with a tape at at the top from the lid so there is no chance of leakage uh, um, you place cotton beside it uh, and then in the you can place it in the racks and you have this zip pouch bags which act as the secondary uh, receptacle 
you need to transport in a cold chain so you get this ice packs which are kept in the refrigerator freezer and then when you are going to transport just place them in the sides this is the thermocol box or the vaccine carrier box you have to place this ice packs and in the middle you place the viral transport medium in the uh, zip zip pouch bags and send the requisition form separately ha huh? so requisition forms are mostly non infectious so do not mix them up with the potentially infectious viral transport mediums send them separately in a separate uh, uh, outside this box and we do the uv decontamination of the forms as well so to avoid any chance of infection now regarding sars cov2 diagnosis we now know and uh, you have heard this term very often in the last year or so that it is a novel coronavirus known as sars cov2 that is uh you see the clinical presentation you might get a uh, non no no symptoms that is a completely asymptomatic individual then you might get a pre symptomatic that is a mild kind of symptoms where they have just started all you or you can get the mild to severe uh, symptomatic patients so it is very important to note that all of them are capable of transmitting infections to others so even your isolation or quarantining of the asymptomatic individuals is equally important to uh, prevent the spread of the disease so next uh, which specimen to collect to you uh, like i said mainly you will have focus on your oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal swab so that will be upper respiratory specimen this slide we will not go into much details because all the other kind of specimens are not currently recommended and what are pcr tests we do is only for the respiratory specimens so if a patient has pneumonia then you might as well send a lower respiratory tract specimens like a bronchial velar lavage or aspirates but always remember that the lower respiratory tract uh, uh, sample collection carries a more risk and uh, there might be aerosolization so you always need a n95 mask while performing such procedures so whenever we talk about the rt pcr or even the you must have heard about gene expert or cbnat uh, that time we detect the nucleic acids of the rna virus since this is an rna virus uh, we we do the rt pcr that is reverse transcriptase pcr that means the rna is converted into the complementary dna and that dna is detected by means of polymerase chain reaction that is creating multiple copies of the nucleic acid so currently this is obviously the gold standard the single most test which has been used widespread in the uh, since last one year or so so uh, that will if you the patient is suffering from the infection you will detect the nucleic acids in the particular specimen second test is the antigen detection that we now we know that the rapid antigen test or also called as rat so it detects the spike as well as the nucleocapsid antigen and not the nucleotide so the rt pcr detects the genes responsible for the particular structures whereas antigen detects the actual antigen on the presence of the uh, virus an antibody response this is the antibody testing not mainly for diagnosis but for mainly the sero surveillance how much of the population has been uh, exposed to the virus and also anyone who has received the vaccine might go for a antibody testing to know whether appropriate response has been occurred in or uh, in the person or not that should be always a neutralizing antibody assay for those who are vaccinated just doing a total antibody count in a, the vaccinated will not make any sense so nucleic base acid detection that is the rt pcr this detects this, the test which we which the lab use should at least detect two virus specific genes this is very important not just a single gene initially when the virus was new we used to have kits with only one target but later on it was found out that that led to uh kind of cross reactivity with your normal human beta corona viruses so we need at least two virus specific genes one e is stands for the envelope gene n stands for the nucleocapsid gene s stands for the gene coding for the spike and there are open reading frames 
और आर एन ए डिपेंडेंट रिवर्स पॉलिमर इज एंजाइम कोडिंग जीन सो एनी ऑफ दिस टू टारगेट शुड बी प्रेजेंट इन वॉट एवर आर टी पी सी टेस्ट वी सिलेक्ट एंड इफ बोथ ऑफ दम टारगेट्स आर डिटेक्टेड दैन द पेशेंट एट द पर्टिक्युलर बिटवीन अ पर्टिक्युलर सिटी वैल्यू देन द पेशेंट इज लेबल्ड एज पॉजिटिव सो दिस इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट चार्ट विच यू माई should know so that you select the right kind of test at the proper stage of the disease as you can see whenever the entry of the organism happens inside the patient person's body you will be have a kind of incubation period where the patient will not show or person will not show any kind of symptoms but the viral count will go on increasing so you can see if you perform nasopharyngeal rt pcr even in this case uh then you, there is a chance that you can find it to be positive so rt pcr uh, remains positive at about 2 3 2 to 3 weeks uh, after the onset of symptom so rt pcr can be done even in the early stage that as soon as the patient becomes symptomatic and this is for a mild kind of covid infection where the uh, viral count will slowly decrease and by the end of fourth and fifth week you will find out that the rt pcr may come as a negative despite the patient being previously positive as we have observed by viral culture the infectivity of the patient starts decreasing by the end of the 10th day or so itself so uh, many of the times your follow up uh, rt pcr is not required you just need to isolate the patient and the patient becomes as good as uh, non infectious by the end of 10 days in most of the mild covid cases for moderate to severe cases it may uh, run up to the uh, third week so you need to isolate the patient according to the syndrome or the spectrum of uh, uh, whether it is mild or moderate and then uh, as you see uh, the latest guidelines of icmr were released uh, probably yesterday so that clearly mentions there is no need of doing a repeat rt pcr of a patient who has been already diagnosed as rt pcr positive because many of the times you will get the dead virus or dead uh, virus or just the rna uh, which is lying in the nasopharynx or oropharynx and it will still persist to come positive so the unnecessarily patient will be subjected to uh, uh, increase isolation uh, it has been observed that pcr has come positive till up to even uh, more than a month or so in some patients even though patient has clinically improved completely recovered from symptoms so um, make the isolation practices based on symptom based rather than a test based strategy then you can see it is detected in the stool also i will not discuss this uh, it ca can be detected much better in your lower respiratory tract uh, uh, specimens like a bronchial alveolar lavage and antibody detection you can see that this igg is the green dotted line purple dotted line is the igm antibody for most of your infectious disease your igm antibody will come first and igg body antibody will come later and continue to persist here you can see that almost at the same time the igm and igg body antibodies are developing igg persists for a slightly longer time whereas igm will drop down so this uh, di zero diagnosis is not done for your uh, diagnosis it is mainly for uh, surveillance purpose or finding whether the person is immune by after vaccination these are the various targets detected in an rt pcr no need to go into the details of this we already discussed that the kit may uh, look out for either the uh, gene coding for the envelope nucleocapsid spike or the non structural proteins coded by the uh, open reading frames or the enzyme rna dependent rna polymerase so this is how a rt pcr graph looks like whenever we see in the machine there will be amplification of the uh, specimen rna uh, were first converted into the complementary dna and the fluorescence is detected by this uh, sigmoid kind of curve and this is the threshold at which it cuts that is known as city value lot of discussion we have had over the past year about city value city value of a rt pcr so this is what the city value is it is the cycle at which the 
graph cuts the threshold. So here you can see approximately the city value will be somewhere around 27 or so. Huh? So we will see what is the significance of city value. Uh, whenever you get the report, you will have either SARS-CoV-2 detected. So that means and in that particular specimen, there was presence of the SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid, that is the RNA. Uh, so the patient will be labeled as positive. Whenever you get the report SARS-CoV-2 not detected, it only means that that particular specimen did not contain the uh, RNA, SARS-CoV-2 RNA. That does not mean the patient is necessarily negative. Always remember if the patient is uh, symptomatic, you repeat the swab after two days uh, if the patient is symptomatic because the, the uh, PCR is only 70% sensitive, whereas it is very specific. So if it comes as positive, it is 100% uh, uh, positive. But if it comes as negative, just keep in mind if the patient is showing clean, high index of clinical suspicion for, uh, for COVID-19, then you repeat the swab after the uh, uh, two days. Then there are these terms, two terms which uh, confuse the physicians a lot of times. So that is inconclusive or invalid. So when do we give inconclusive? It is when one of the genes is detected, but the other one was not uh, detected. So let's say E gene was detected, but N gene was not detected or N gene was detected and uh, RDRP was not detected. So on and other uh, permutations and combinations. So in that case, the lab will uh, label the sample as inconclusive. So it is best to repeat a fresh specimen by, from the patient so that you can uh, do the cl clinical correlation and repeat the test using pro preferably another kit which looks at uh, different targets. And what do you mean by invalid? This also we many of the times get because interns or uh, the, whoever is posted for sample collection may not collect the sample properly uh, or might just send a swab directly to the lab without doing any kind of collection. So no human cells or tissues are picked up. In that case, the machine shows that there is no presence of a, uh, internal control that is human uh, tissue or cells. And then that will be known as an invalid specimen. So if we get the invalid result, the lab repeats the extraction of the nucleic acid once again on the specimen. And again, if it comes as invalid, then that means the specimen was not collected by the person properly and you have to send a repeat sample. So turnaround time for most of the PCR assays is about eight hours. So like I said, how many times should we uh, do? So if it is positive, any of this, a uh, rapid antigen test, CBNAT, RT-PCR or TrueNAT, any of this is positive, that is confirmatory. End of the discussion. There is no need to repeat uh, a positive test. There is absolutely no need. And the ICMR has uh, released the guideline uh, for the same uh, just uh, uh, of uh, yesterday. So no retesting is recommended. Repeat by uh, the RT-PCR is recommended in rapid antigen negative symptomatic patient. So that is why filling up the form is very important. If the patient is symptomatic and negative by rapid antigen test, then yes, you need to do a RT-PCR uh, on the test, on the patient. So we, what we do in our lab is we collect both rapid antigen tests and a RT-PCR sample. And if the rapid antigen test comes negative in the symptomatic, we do as a reflex kind of testing for the RT-PCR. So when the suspicion is high and the first test result is negative, uh, then you repeat the RT-PCR on a fresh sample. Always keep this in mind. So just uh, uh, quickly, we'll discuss some cases here. So 35-year-old male with fever and dry cough, his uh, throat swab was collected and the test report came, SARS-CoV-2 not detected. So any of these statements can be true that the result is true negative since PCR has high sensitivity. Throat swab is not the specimen of choice. Specimen quality is unsatisfactory and repeat test is indicated. So yes, we know that theoretically PCR based tests are very sensitive, even as low as 10 organisms per ml of the sample if it is present, then also it will be detected. Uh, but whatever targets we 
the lab decides to target that uh, uh, affects the sensitivity. So roughly around a nasopharyngeal swab will be around 60 to 80% sensitive. So it is always a good idea to keep, to collect both the nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swab and put it in the same viral transport medium and so that you get the uh, proper yield. And then you need to know that every report will write a negative test does not rule out the presence of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, understand that that particular report is only for that particular specimen, which may not have the virus at that time. Yeah. Uh... I think so. I have some uh, issues with uh, changing the slides, but I'll I'll continue nonetheless huh, without the uh, uh, you know slides. Sir, please continue. Yeah. So, like I was saying, always for a uh, negative RT PCR, and if you have the uh, what you say high index of suspicion, you need to continue with, uh, you need to repeat the RT-PCR. Secondly, for the rapid antigen test, like I said, always mention the symptoms. Uh, always prefer a nasopharyngeal swab collection for the rapid antigen test. All the kits mention only the nasopharyngeal swab is required for a Rapid antigen test. Do not send a oropharyngeal swab for a rapid antigen test. That is very important because nasopharyngeal swab is the uh, uh, specimen of choice for a rapid antigen test. Uh, so uh, whenever you receive the uh, report for a SARS-CoV-2 uh, RT-PCR re report, you will always find some kind of comments uh, which are uh, generally common to all the labs. I'll just read out the comments on my uh, on the uh, our KEM lab report that it mentions a single negative test result in a symptomatic patient does not exclude infection. And second uh, point is repeat sampling and testing of specimens is strongly recommended in such cases. Collect both throat and nasal swab after 24 to 48 hours and put in the same VTM, transport to the lab in a cold chain. So always remember this, if you are having a symptomatic patient with a high index of suspicion, repeat the swab. Now, what are the advantage and disadvantage of RT-PCR? Advantage is it is a simple qualitative test uh, with high sensitivity and accuracy, but uh, the quality of sample is very important. Like I said, the proper specimen collection, which we saw in the earlier uh, part of lecture, that is very important. Now, one more important point, which I want to cover here is the CT value. You have seen this being discussed. I initially, there were a lot of misconceptions in the physicians, as well as it was spreading through on WhatsApp, and many of the non-medical people picked it up, and they, they were saying that CT value, if it's less, then it's more serious infection. Hai. Jada spread oga. There is nothing like this. Please understand, even ICMR has clarified this. The CT value, whatever they write, like SARS CoV 2 detected, and CT value is 23, 27, or 19, 16. All this does not correlate with anything. CT value is just a means for the test to decide whether that is the cutoff for the test kit to decide whether it is positive or not. For most of the kids, it is 35 to 36. If the CT value comes beyond 35 to 36, we give it as a negative test result. But we have seen serious patients who are having CT value of 28 and totally asymptomatic uh, or mild COVID patients with a CT value of 16, et cetera. So, uh, these are purely qualitative tests and not quantitative tests. So do not rely on the CT value. It is CT value. Uh, uh, most of the labs should not actually re uh, report the CT value. Like our lab does not report the CT value because there is no use for the physician 
uh, to in determining the CT value. If it would have been a quantitative test, then only like you have, you must have heard about HIV viral load or HBV viral load in which quantitative testing is done. In that case, the viral load is a significant aspect, but it, whatever we are doing for SARS-CoV-2 is currently only qualitative, which says, yes, whether SARS-CoV-2 RNA is present or not present. So it is a yes or no uh, uh, test and not a quantitative test that you can quantify that this particular person has ha is having more virus in his throat and this particular person has less virus. So ICMR has clearly uh, clarified this, that there is no correlation of CT values with the severity, neither the infectivity. So always remember this in mind. Uh, there have been various pu publications to this effect also that CT value does not correlate with uh, the severity. And CT value cutoffs are different for different assays. So whichever assay the lab uses, uh, one private lab may use another uh, RT-PCR kit, another lab may use another. So the CT value of one particular lab may not be similar to the CT value of the another lab. So do not compare to uh, lab reports uh, of the same patient. They might come different. Uh, last very important point I want to make here is that these are not test of cure. Again, uh, yesterday's guideline used by ICMR clarifies this completely that you do not need to repeat a swab of an already positive patient uh, because it con con continues to persist to come positive in many patients because of the dead virus or your RNA just sticking in the uh, nasopharynx or the oropharyngeal region. So if the patient clinically improves, you uh, go ahead, you can uh, stop the isolation of the patient or you can discharge whatever the current uh, management is with the patient. You can change over the management and consider the patient non-infection non-infectious if the patient has been asymptomatic, totally asymptomatic uh, and resolution of symptoms, three days more to that and probably one week more as a kind of home, home quarantine for the patient. So roughly you uh, need to make a clinical decision based on the recovery of the patient and the, if the patient is seem, seemingly fine, is doing well, much better than before, then there is no need of repeating the RT-PCR. Uh, you have seen this, lots of people, are, doctors are coming out that no need to repeat the RT-PCR, no need to do another CT scan, no need to do the biomarkers as well. You just need to assess the patient clinically. Uh, last point, uh, that is the zero diagnosis used mainly for the uh, zero surveillance as to how many percentage of the people in that particular area is are uh, affected with have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 virus. It does not, it cannot be used for diagnosis. Understand that many labs, especially on social media, are advertising this test of uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibody. Uh, do not do this test. These are non-standardized tests and they don't, do not diagnose the condition for diagnosis, only a rapid antigen test or a RT-PCR test is recommended. And if you have been vaccinated, then to know your protective status, you have to go for a neutralizing antibody test only and not the total antibody count. Yeah, so that will that is about it. Sorry for the kind of technical glitches, but uh, I hope this message has gone through. Just to reiterate and summarize that uh, specimen collection is a very important part and do not repeat a positive RT-PCR test. And if you have a high index of clinical suspicion uh, in a patient who has come negative, just do a repeat RT-PCR. Yeah. Uh, I'm done, madam. Thank you very much, sir, for excellent presentation. Uh, I'm again extremely sorry that in the beginning, in the morning also, there is an internet connectivity issue at my side also. And therefore, I have disconnected from this meeting. So extremely sorry for that. And for that purpose, I have not introduced Dr. Uh, Shiraj sir. 
Up till now, we have covered about in detail about COVID vaccination, but different types of prevention measures, and how we can diagnose a COVID case in detail about diagnosis. Now, in the present session, we covered in detail about COVID-19 clinical syndrome. What are the different stages of the COVID? That is, asymptomatic, mild, moderate, severe, and critical cases, and in this session, we will be covering what are the different clinical features and details, complications of COVID. So, for that, I invite Dr. Inamdar Manish sir. Sir is professor and head in the Department of Organ and Medicine. Sorry, uh, Department of Homeopathic Materia Medica at the Saukar Homeopathic Medical College, Sakara. He is a member of Academic Council of MUHS Nasik. Then Faculty of Homeopathy and Board of Study at MUHS Nasi. He is an editor of the Classical Science of Peer Review National Scientific Control Journal. So I welcome you, sir. I quote thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are clearly audible. Sir, uh, please. I, I'm sharing my screen. Please okay. let me know whether you can see the screen. Yes, sir. Whether the screen is visible, madam? Yes, sir. Screen is visible. Okay. So sir, should I start? Slideshow mode. Yes, yes, yes. It is in the slideshow mode. Are you there, Sachin? Manish, this is not the slideshow mode. One minute. One minute, sir. One minute, sir. Slideshow mode. Slideshow mode. Slideshow mode. Yes, sir. Now it's a slideshow mode. A slideshow mode? Please continue, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you. So at the outset, I would first like to thank the Vice Chancellor of the University, the Registrar of MUHS Nasik, and all the university authorities and officials for creating such a wonderful platform to learn and to share. At the same time, I would also like to thank the Dean of my homeopathic faculty in MUHS, Dr. D.G. Bagal, sir, for giving me an opportunity to express my views. So now let's begin with my presentation. In last 16 or 17 months, the most used word I think is COVID-19. The most searched word on the internet site is COVID-19. So be he is a common man or a practicing medical professional, 
be it a student of first year or whether he is an internee, the most searched word still is COVID-19. This tiny virus that is SARS-CoV-2 has changed our life to such a greater extent that our life is moving in circle around this COVID-19 disease. Whether we are a first year student or a last year student, whether we are an internee or a practicing doctor, now what is expected from us is we should behave as a COVID warriors or we are now termed as a COVID warriors. Now, once it is decided that we are COVID warriors, then our job is to fight a battle. So whom, to whom against we are fighting this battle? So our enemy is COVID-19 disease. So before going into the battle, before actually being into the battlefield, let us understand what this COVID virus is or what is COVID-19 disease is. Actually, even a common man, you ask few symptoms of COVID-19, he will tell you. But, but even after crores of patients and even after millions of death, no one can fully claim that he understands the disease in total. And fortunately, there are lots of universities where the messages are flaring up here and there, which create a panic in the mind of common man. So they are running from post to pillar in the search of investigation to get admitted in the hospital because they have very fake or very limited information in their hands. Forget about the common man. Let us talk about ourselves. Now we are going into the battlefield today or tomorrow. So we'll need to have the practical knowledge of this coronavirus disease or COVID-19. So what is expected from us, we pay, uh, people is as a primary physician, as a frontline worker, we need to suspect early. Because if we can suspect the COVID infection early in a patient, even when he is asymptomatic, then probably we can do earlier investigations. If earlier investigations can be done, then there is a chance that the case may be diagnosed early. If case is diagnosed early, we can intervene early. Either we can refer the patient to a care center if it is needed, or we ourselves can start the treatment if the case is mild and it can, can be a patient can be kept at his own home. If early treatment is initiated, then there is a less chance of hospitalization because hospitals are already overburdened with the amount of patients that are running to them. Whenever there is a less chance of hospitalization and earlier treatment is initiated based on earlier investigations and earlier diagnosis, the mortality is reduced. And as hospitalization is minimized, as the mortality is reduced, we can say that we have a better outcome. So what is the need of our is to look for a better outcome. And for that, we have to suspect early, we have to investigate early, we have to diagnose early, we have to treat early. And for that purpose, we have to have clear understanding in our mind about the clinical presentation, about the clinical status of COVID-19. So let us begin our journey from basic to complex. So what are the common symptoms of COVID-19 clinical syndrome? Now, these common symptoms are known even to a common man. Even if ask any common man, what are the three symptoms? He will tell you that there is a fever, that there is a dry cough, and there is a fatigue. Now this fatigue many times can be described as a tiredness or a feeling of generalized weakness. Every patient will not tell you that he is experiencing fatigue. What are the less common symptoms then? Less common symptoms. They are loss of taste or smell. When I'm saying these symptoms are less common, it doesn't mean that they have a limited diagnostic value. Probably they have more diagnostic value, but less number of patients will be able to describe this symptom in initial stages. So the less common symptoms, what we get clinically is loss of taste or loss of smell, nasal congestion, conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis was initially not considered as a symptom of COVID-19, but now there are cases, there are evidences where conjunctivitis is the symptom of COVID-19 disease. Sore throat may or may not present in all patients. Headache, 
मसल पेन और जॉइंट पेन क्लासिकली नोन एज माइलजिया और बॉडी एक इन सम केसेस यू मे हैव पेशेंट प्रेजेंटिंग विथ डायरिया फ्यू पेशेंट मे हैव जी आई सिम्टम लाइक वॉमिटिंग एंड वेरियस टाइप्स ऑफ स्किन रैश कैन बी सीन इन अ पेशेंट हु आइदर हैज फीवर ड्रैक ऑफ फॉर फटीग एंड इवन इन अबसेंस ऑफ दीज प्रोड्रोमल सिम्टम्स स्किन रैश डायरिया एंड वॉमिटिंग कैन बी सीन एज अ प्रेजेंटिंग सिम्टम so when the disease progresses from a mild to moderate and moderate to severe the presenting symptom picture changes initially it was only fever it was only dry cough and the feeling of generalized weakness now as the patient progresses from mild to moderate and moderate to severe the common presenting symptoms which we can get is rather than cough now there is a shortness of breath the patient respiratory rate might have increased or it is normal but patient is complaining that there is some sort of difficulty in breathing initially there was loss of taste maybe now there is a loss of appetite called as anorexia no desire to eat food there can be confusion there can be persistent pain or pressure in the chest this is not found in each and every patient but this symptom can be there now whether this is related to respiratory system or cardiovascular system we are going to discuss it later on and the temperature which was mild initially gets increased and the patient is now showing high temperature now even in a serious case even in a moderate case we need to get or we see to get some uncommon symptoms or less common symptoms what are those symptoms one is irritability the patient is extremely irritable it may be due to anxiety actually there may be reduced consciousness or what i can say there can be an altered consciousness patient is not fully conscious but he is not unconscious neither is in a coma nor is in a stuporous condition but the consciousness is definitely altered he may have sleep disorders patient may just can complain to you that he is not getting enough sleep or his sleep is unrefreshing and in very rare cases in very rare percentage of the patient the less common symptom of a severe covid-19 can be a stroke that is a cerebrovascular accident either an infarct or intracerebral bleed and in few cases even delirium that is disorientation to time place and person can be a symptom seen in severe disease so now who is at more risk of serious illness everybody can get mild symptoms of covid-19 but there is some class of patient in which the covid-19 can become serious now these conditions are called as comorbidities if these conditions are present in a patient keep it mind that this patient can get can move from mild to moderate or moderate to severe now what are those comorbidities age about 60 years if the patient is a known case of hypertension or ischemic heart disease or a diabetes mellitus disease if the patient is a known case of chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder or a case of asthma if patient is having obesity if patient is having chronic kidney disease if the patient is a known case of carcinoma or cancer or an immunocompromised patient now these patients are likely to move from mild to moderate or moderate to severe now when i am talking about hypertension ischemic heart disease diabetes i mean to say even if the diseases are well under control we have to keep in our mind that even a well controlled disease patient can get serious as compared to a patient who does not have history of hypertension ihd and diabetes mellitus but read the bottom line that is very important even though the above mentioned conditions are called as comorbidities anyone can get sick with covid-19 and become seriously ill and may die hence good understanding of clinical presentation keeping good watch on the respiratory rate the pulse rate the temperature and all other clinical manifestations extremely essential so that the journey of the patient from mild to severe can be easily diagnosed at an earlier stage if possible it can be prevented so that the comorbidities and mortality can be reduced once the patient is infected with coronavirus 
how much is the time required for a person to present us with symptoms averagely within first 5 to 6 days the patient will show you some or the other symptom either a fever or a cough or a sore throat or a nasal condition congestion or a headache like symptoms averagely they can be seen within 5 to 6 days but actual period ranges from 1 to 14 days that is why whenever is person is diagnosed or person is in a close contact of a person who was already positive the quarantine period or the home isolation period is suggested is minimum 14 days now if you look at the guidelines issued by the covid task force of maharashtra now they say that rather than 14 days you can keep the patient in quarantine for 17 days to be a safer side but in almost 85% of the patient within less than 11 days in 98% of the patient you will see that the symptoms are developing now the ratio of symptomatic to asymptomatic patient i don't have the statistic about it that once the patient is infected how many patients will remain symptomatic how many patients will remain asymptomatic but the good point is 80 to 85% of the patient recover without being need to get hospitalized so this is good thing but for them to get recovered they should have no comorbidities they should be diagnosed early and they should have started the treatment early only 50 to 20% of the patient will need hospitalization out of which 5% of the patient will need an icu management and as you know the mortality is rate is between 1.5 to 2% so now let us understand the symptoms the most common symptoms of a covid-19 are fever cough and fatigue in almost 78% of the cases the fever will be presenting symptom in almost 57% of the cases cough will be there along with fever or even without fever and in 31% of the cases the fatigue the body ache the generalized weakness will be complained of the patient but these symptoms do not indicate anything about the severity of the infection or severity of the condition but if along with cough fever and fatigue you get shortness of breath difficulty in breathing dyspnea then this is a strong predictor that patient is likely moving from mild to severe phase now along with these few prodromal symptoms or which we can say common symptoms like fever and cough there are other symptoms which are commonly associated with covid-19 infection what are those symptoms now we can call these symptoms as musculo skeletal symptoms so one is a myalgia that is generalized body ache or a joint pains pain specifically in the knees or elbows or a wrist joint or patient just may complain of a back ache and there is a fatigue last symptom is headache now this myalgia joint pain fatigue and headache is commonly seen in any viral infection even if it is not covid just a simple case of influenza you get to see the symptoms of myalgia joint pain fatigue and headache and hence as they are very common in any trivial viral infection they are generally overlooked actually these symptoms are disturbing from the patient because four days ago three days ago five days ago patient was not having any complaint since last three four days patient has started developing myalgia joint pain fatigue and headache but he is neither complaining nor he himself is giving enough attention so as to complain it to the doctor the doctor since last 3 4 days i am having these complaints out of these four complaints headache i think requires special attention because the patients who are then hospitalized due to moderate or severe disease in 34% of the such patient when history is being taken they say that headache was their presenting symptom that was not properly care, taken care of the case was not investigated early so from mild patient rapidly went into the stage of moderate disease and now he needed to be hospitalized in a patients who are in icu 6 to 10% of the patient will still complain that headache was their presenting symptom now what kind of headache is this generally this headache is moderate to severe not of a mild variety it's a bilateral a temporoparietal headache if the patient is complaining of pain in the temporoparietal region without any obvious cause neither is have a diabetes neither is have a raised hyper, uh, blood pressure 
neither he was exposed to the heat of the sun neither was there any prodromal symptom only complaining of bilateral temporoparietal headache or periorbital pains you should suspect that probably he may be covid positive i remember a case of my friend who himself was a doctor is a doctor his mother complained of headache for two days she was neither hypertensive nor diabetic neither she moved out of her house for last one month but as headache was having what is the bottom line poor response to common analgesic the para tablet paracetamol was given for her for two days even after taking tablet paracetamol her headache was not relieved he was wise enough to get her investigated and she was rt pcr positive even though it was a mild case but the simple complaint of headache could diagnose the case as positive now as we are saying that covid 19 is not one clinical condition so the topic or title of the topic is clinical syndrome of covid 19 why because it never affects only one system or one organ it has a capacity to affect almost all organs in the body almost all systems in the body and it can produce wide range of clinical manifestations symptoms so we use the term syndrome rather than a clinical condition so along with respiratory system the common system affected or patient is presenting before us is gastrointestinal system where the common manifestation can be nausea vomiting and diarrhea now out of these three diarrhea again needs special attention as we because we know that sars cov2 infection can directly infect enterocytes that is the cells of git and it can instigate the inflammatory response in the git as the dr shiraj was taking, uh, telling us that whatever we are doing today is we are collecting the respiratory swabs either nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal so as to diagnose or do the test of uh, rt pcr but the research was done where viral RNA, uh, rna was found in rectal swab of few patients who presented with diarrhea and in whom nasopharyngeal swab was negative so this diarrhea can be considered as a presenting symptom even when even if there is absence of fever and cough there is a persistent diarrhea for 2 to 3 days in a current scenario you should suspect that patient might be covid positive along with the diarrhea the common other symptom is mouth ulcer with which patients are repeatedly presenting now it can be a presenting symptom or when the treatment has already been started from mild to moderate case the patient will complain of mouth ulcer now interesting fact is patients with covid 19 induced ards that is those patients who go into the stage of acute respiratory distress syndrome and who are covid positive they tend to show more gi complications than those patients who are covid negative so what are the other symptoms which are related to git in a covid positive patient one is trans amyanitis the trans amyanitis is nothing but increase the levels of some enzymes secreted by the liver most commonly it is alt alanine trans amyanase or ast aspirate trans amyanase if you do the biochemical investigations then you can see that trans amyanase are increased then there can be severe ileus we commonly called it as a paralytic ileus where the peristaltic movement of intestine is lost and intestines fail to throw away the waste products through anus and last but not the least there can be ischemia of the bowel again this is due to microvascular injury and coagulopathy as a pathology which develops in severe critical illnesses now along with git we do have few ent symptoms that is ear nose and throat symptoms what are the less common symptoms in ent rhinorrhea there is a discharge from the ear nasal congestion sneezing and a sore throat again these are very common symptoms even in allergic rhinitis even in common upper respiratory tract infection we do get these symptoms they don't have any diagnostic value but along with these symptoms if patient complaining of anosmia that is loss of smell more found in females that is an important sign to suspect to do the rt pcr or rapid antigen test now 
this anosmia that is loss of smell is generally not related to inflammatory changes in the nasal mucosa neither it is related to nasal obstruction so the patient is complaining of anosmia you do examine his nose there are no hypertrophic nasal turbinates there is no congestion there is no redness suspect covid positive the loss of smell and loss of taste if they combine with each other then it is a enough positive indication for covid 19 and if there is a anosmia that is loss of smell if there is a fatigue if there is a persistent cough along with loss of appetite that this combination of four symptoms can clinically confirm that this case is covid 19 positive now most important thing which we all know is covid pneumonia which increases the morbidity which increases the mortality for which the patients are frequently admitted in the hospital is covid pneumonia i am not going to go into the detail of pathology of pneumonia we all are doctors we all are medical students so we know what is pneumonia is but when i am talking about covid 19 pneumonia generally there are two types one is a l type l and other is a type h the type l l means low so the pathology as is at a lower rate so patient is comparatively better than h h is very high so what indicates l there is a low elastance when i say low elastance means there is a high compliance of the lung low ventilation to perfusion ratio the lung weight is not much increased when you do hrct of the chest only ground glass opacities are seen on the x ray chest and there is low lung recruitability in this type l patients as the lung compliance is just low or near to normal you may see that few patients do not complain of dyspnea even when they are admitted into the hospital this is type l and the type h there is a high elastance means low lung compliance the ventilation to perfusion ratio is very high the lung weight is increased if you do the quantitative analysis on hrct what we see the is there are more non aerated area in both the lungs and it indicates severe ards now what i mean by lung recruitability is for artificial ventilation or during mechanical ventilation when the patient is already on the ventilator support or mechanical support more pressure need to be given from the temporary airway so as to open up the collapsed alveoli but generally in type h this attempt is not always successful as already severe ards has developed into the patient now what ards does is it causes diffuse alveolar damage which may finally lead to lung fibrosis this lung fibrosis term is also known to us this diffuse alveolar damage leads to lung fibrosis and this lung fibrosis is found in almost 15 to 20% of the patient who are admitted in the tertiary care center of the covid hospital now ards is a well known term even when we were witnessing the swine flu few years ago this ards term was there in the picture which was a cause of death it's a well known term it develops in about 40% of the patient who are admitted in the covid hospital in almost 60 to 80% of the patient who are in the icu two important parameters to judge whether patient is going into the stage of ards or not one is a respiratory rate generally the respiratory rate about 24 and spo2 below 92 to 93 can clinically tell you that patient is in the ards now as a primary physician we must know how to calculate the respiratory rate and even if the patient is of a mild variety he is in the home isolation where you are doing the telephonic conversation with the patient you are taking his regular follow up you must teach them how to measure your respiratory rate he should inform to you because it is often found that patients are unaware that they are hyperventilating even 
we have few cases of doctors who were doing their duties in the ward in the operation theater they were hyperventilating that hyperventilation was informed to them by their associates that sir you are hyperventilating then they made their investigation and the covid score was quite high on hrct the score was quite high so optimum value must be given to the respiratory rate now next is the cardiovascular system now when this cardiovascular symptoms develop in combination with pre existing symptoms or symptoms of respiratory tract they generally complicate the case and mortality rate is increase so presenting symptom in many of the cardiovascular cases can be just a chest pain or feeling of pressure at variable locations but it is not only that we have enough evidence that this sars corona virus can infect cardiomyocytes that is cells of myocardium it can infect pericytes the cells which are at intervals along the line of capillaries and it can infect fibroblasts also so pericytes are very important for us because they maintain the blood brain barrier now what is the significance of it i will discuss it later on but for maintenance of the blood brain barrier these pericytes are very important and they can be infected with sars cov2 virus and fibroblast as we all know they synthesize collagen which is very important for healing of the wound so in current scenario even you have a typical patient of a coronary artery disease or an acute coronary syndrome you should suspect or you should investigate him for covid-19 even though there is no fever or no cough a random study was done for 100 patients who were admitted in the hospital and as a protocol or as a part of study they were very, they were being investigated for the status of the cardiovascular system and surprisingly only 32 patients were having normal echocardiogram within first 24 hours so that can be the severity of infection if that can be diagnosed early then complications can be avoided so what is now acs or acute coronary syndrome we all know it is clinically manifested as a chest pain or a discomfort the pain may radiate to the shoulder to the hand to the fingers to the neck or to the jaw there is a dyspnea there can be dizziness or there is a heavy feeling or heavy sweating rather then there is a sudden and unusual fatigue the patient who was well 15 minutes ago now he is complaining of sudden fatigue sudden loss of strength suspect something is going wrong with his heart and there can be extreme restlessness now remember one this presentation that is a presentation of acute myocardial injury can be complicated by arrhythmia developing either at the atrial level or ventricular level where on 2d echo you can see that there is reduced left ventricular ejection fraction which is normally 55 60% or just above that it is as low as 40 45% now these symptoms along with the chest pain if you investigate the patient right at this time they can show you that these patient have elevated troponin that is a cardiac marker on ecg you might see st depression or you may have a t wave abnormality along with symptoms like ventricular tachycardia remember one thing the patient is admitted in the hospital for respiratory manifestations even if his respiratory complaints are improving his respiratory status is improving he can get cardiovascular system symptoms related to cvs and the case again can get complicated now next is coagulopathy thrombosis and embolism in a few patients who are admitted in the covid hospital with presenting component of pneumonia they show you the symptoms related to coagulopathy and this again complicates the case now this coagulopathy that is intravascular coagulation of the blood results in commonly deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism or it may lead to ischemic stroke generally an infarct or even a myocardial infarction 
though it is more common in elderly younger patients are not spared and along with increased troponin these patient do have higher d dimer levels now next is neurological symptoms initially when everybody was learning about or doing research about the clinical phenomenon of covid 19 the neurological symptoms received less attention but now we know that this sars cov virus can have effect on central nervous system as well as peripheral nervous system so what are the common manifestations when the neurological symptoms develop the common manifestations are encephalopathy encephalitis gulen barre syndrome stroke or even epileptic seizures or convulsions can be a presenting symptom now this stroke either can be a presenting symptom or it can be a late complication of covid-19 disease now this neurological manifestations are either due to direct viral infection which is crossing the blood brain barrier now while discussing cardiovascular system i told you about the pericytes which are very important to maintain the blood brain barrier now as the pericytes are infected with sars cov2 the blood brain barrier is lost and viral infection directly spreads to the brain or central nervous system or there can be hypoxic brain injury the patient is hyperventilating his spo2 is low that can lead to nerve uh, damage to the cns or it can be due to vascular cause that is coagulopathy resulting in thromboembolism last but not the least do give enough attention to the kidney even when case is of mild variety and patient is having comorbidity do not forget to investigate renal function test that is very important because the symptoms of renal injury may develop late but when they develop the mortality is very high so what are the renal injury symptoms or renal injury pathologies there can be acute tubular necrosis or acute tubular injury there can be collapsing glomerulosclerosis on investigation gfr that is glomerular filtration rate is less than 60 ml per minute and patient is probably in hypotension his systolic bp is less than 100 mm of hg almost 20% of the icu patient that is patients who already have severe covid-19 disease develop acute kidney injury and out of those 30% of the patient may require dialysis so if you can investigate early if you can suspect early then further damage probably can be prevented now this term is again well known to everybody everybody talks about cytokine storm or cytokine release syndrome now what is the cytokine release syndrome they are nothing but inflammatory markers the sars cov2 has a capacity to instigate severe inflammatory response in a host that is a patient which releases inflammatory markers along with some clinical manifestations so what are those clinical manifestations high grade fever tachycardia dyspnea increased hypoxia means reduction in the spo2 and hypotension if you see that the patient i is having fever cough and myalgia if on the 7th to 10th day he develops a high grade fever he develops a tachycardia he develops dyspnea his spo2 is dropping down his blood pressure is dropping down do suspect or be sure that he is in the cytokine release phase now this cytokine release phase is again associated with increased mortality this release phase is mainly due to microvascular thrombosis that occurs with rapid onset acute kidney injury there can be along with other symptoms like high grade fever and tachycardia patient may show you the symptoms like convulsions patient go into the stage of shock patient can you show you the symptoms of ischemic heart disease or pulmonary vasculopathy so cytokine storm should not be missed or as it develops or 7 to 10th day enough follow up must be kept with the patient for a minimum period of 12 to 14 days even though the case is mild even though the case is moderate now 
the covid task force of government of maharashtra has classified the clinical manifestations of this covid 19 disease into different stages so stage 1 is a mild infection this now stage 1 is again classified into three groups group a group b and group c the stage 2 is having again two groups stage 2a and stage 2b stage 2a there is a pulmonary involvement without hypoxia stage 2b pulmonary involvement with hypoxia stage 3 pulmonary involvement with hypoxia with sepsis maybe with septic shock and multi organ dysfunction now this cytokine storm about which we are talking ultimately leads to multi organ dysfunction if proper care is not taken right at that time so what is clinical staging stage 1 group a patients are asymptomatic but they are covid positive now special attention must be given to this asymptomatic patient because they think that they don't have any disease they move around here and there but they have equal capacity to infect others and even if the patient is asymptomatic today tomorrow he can get symptomatic so close follow up is must with asymptomatic patients also then stage 1 group b this is a group where there is mild upper respiratory tract infection symptoms so what are the presenting symptoms again fever dry cough myalgia anosmia that is loss of smell there may be loss of taste diarrhea may be presenting symptom in few of the case and few patients may complain of shortness of breath it may not be a symptom related to hypoxia but maybe out of anxiety they may complain that there is having some difficulty in the respiration even though these symptoms are common symptoms the case is of a mild severity what are there are some warning signs if these warning signs are observed in any of the patient you need to hurry you need to investigate you might need to refer the patient what are those warning signs one is a resting tachycardia patient is at rest not doing any work his pulse rate is above 100 suspect something wrong is going with the patient his spo2 that is oxygen saturation falls below 94% at the room air do suspect something is going wrong even if you are clinically suspecting something fishy then along with spo2 at a room air take a 6 minute walk test ask the patient to walk in his own room for 6 minute record the spo2 before and record the spo2 after if there is a drop of more than 3% initially it was 99 now it is less than 96 initially it was 95 now it has dropped down to 92 something is fishy there you do cbc in all the cases of upper respiratory tract infection suspecting that it can be a covid if neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is less than 3.5 more than 3.5 because the covid 19 infection is associated with lymphocytopenia do suspect that something is wrong going with the patient patient is not in the class of mild case it is going to the stage of moderate severity and p to f ratio now what is p is partial pressure of oxygen which is normally 80 to 100 mm of hg in arterial blood and fractional air inspired or fraction of the oxygen in the inspired air now this is generally about 300 to 400 mm of hg if it is less than 300 again i suspect something fishy now this pf ratio has clinical significance what is the significance significance related to mortality if it is between 200 to 300 the mortality will be around 25% if it is between 100 to 200 the mortality will be around 32% and if it is less than 100 that the mortality will be as high as 40% now the stage 1 group c still the patient is mild still he has the symptoms of upper respiratory tract infection but now the patient is with comorbidities about which we are talking earlier age above 60 years known case of diabetes hypertension ihd copd immunocompromised patient a patient who is a known case of chronic kidney disease a patient who is obese or patient is having chronic liver disease like liver cirrhosis should be considered as a comorbid case and few warning signs again resting tachycardia pf ratio 
न्यूट्रोफिल टू लिम्फोसाइट रेशियो इज हायर देन थ्री पॉइंट फाइव एंड सीआरपी इफ इट इज रेज डी डायमर इफ इट इज हाय फेरिटीन इफ इट इज हाय एंड एल डी एच दट इज लैक्ट्रो लैक्टोज डी हाइड्रोजन इज इफ इट इज हाय डू नॉट कंसिडर इट एज अ माइल्ड केस रेफर द पेशेंट टू द सेंटर वेर एप्रोप्रिएट केयर कैन बी टेकन नाउ द ग्रुप टू स्टेज टू ग्रुप डी हियर now this infection is not in the upper respiratory tract the infection is in the lower respiratory tract patient has already developed pneumonia but there is no respiratory failure however the patient is still complaining of fever cough and dyspnea but now spo2 may be less than 93 partial pressure of oxygen may be more than 60 mm of hg and respiratory rate is still less than 24 okay the patient is not deteriorating but if neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is disturbing pf ratio is again less than 300 ray crp d dimer ferritin ldh and triglycerides again in this scenario probably patient will go into the stage of respiratory failure today or tomorrow stage 2 group e here there is a pneumonia established case of pneumonia patient is already admitted in the hospital and he is showing the symptoms of respiratory failure the respiratory rate is now more than 24 spo2 is less than 93% partial pressure of oxygen is also disturbed and along with all other warning signs like neutrophil lymphocyte ratio pf ratio resting tachycardia the cpk mb is high the troponin 1 that is both the cardiac markers are high and you do investigate for interleukin 6 interleukin 6 is high the patient is going into the stage of severe covid illness stage 3 lastly group f patient is in the stage of pneumonia with hypoxia with sepsis or a septic shock and he is leading into the stage of multi organ dysfunction or multi order failure probably this patient will already be in the icu so all the parameters all the warning signs are as earlier patient is already in the stage of ards and patient either may have involvement of one more system either there is a acute kidney injury developing or thrombosis and coagulation has already developed or he has some manifestation related to cardiovascular system all things are there but if we are aware about this clinical staging as suggested by the task force of covid 19 then probably we can give a right advice to the patient i have not discuss about one more complication which we are recently observing that is mucormycosis it is actually a fungal infection which affect the skin and the subcutaneous tissue it's a deadly infection what happens is it is generally common in the patient who are having uncontrolled diabetes but as they are going into the stage of ards along with other medical treatment the steroids are given to them which makes the patient susceptible to secondary bacterial infections and fungal infection this in turn creates a cascade or a vicious cycle that this mucormycosis is created this mucormycosis they again may enter into the microcirculation they again can block it and the case will again become complicated remember this mucormycosis if develop along with severe covid 19 symptoms the mortality may be above 40% so this what i wanted to say about the clinical manifestations of covid 19 so what is our duty is to timely suspect timely investigate timely intervene timely treat and timely refer the patient so that the morbidity and mortality can be further avoided i think i have done thank you thank you all thank you thank you very much sir for a excellent presentation you have explained very well about covid clinical syndrome start from the what are the symptoms 
common symptoms and the rare symptoms in addition to that the stages of the covid that is 80% of the patients are asymptomatic then classification like mild in mild there are stages a b c then moderate which is again divided into two type and severe covid covid with critical patient so stages a to f you have explained very well then the investigations which we will perform in covid patient that is d dimer c reactive protein levels then serum ferritin level thrombocytopenia is important we monitor we must monitor the platelet count in addition to that neutrophil lymphocyte ratio is very important so less than 3.5 so with this i am very much thankful sir for explaining all these in detail thank you very much for your spending valuable time with us and in future we expect same cooperation from you thank, thank you ma'am thank you thank you thank you very much over to you motiwala sir now up till now we have covered since morning the diagnosis test for the covid then What is COVID clinical symptom? Now, for the next part, remaining part is management of this COVID. So, for that, I invite Dr. Motiwala sir. Sir is principal of Motiwala Homeopathic Medical College, Nasi. He is not only a very good administrator, but in addition to that, he is a very good academician. And in this pandemic. He is managing the COVID care hospital at Motiwala Homeopathic Medical College, Nasi, and this institute has successfully treated more than thousand patients of COVID. So I welcome you, Dr. Motiwala sir, and over to you, sir. A very good morning, dear friends, my colleagues, faculty members. and uh, the wonderful students that have joined today it's a very uh, this topic is very hot at the moment i think everywhere you go right from the marketplace to your own homes the only discussion is covid covid and covid and there are so much of misconceptions so much of fear along with this and uh, sorry for interruption please share your screen yes will be i'll be doing it shortly yeah okay okay go ahead so uh with all this uh is the screen there no sir screen is not seen Yeah, yeah, no, we have the co-host. Is sharing or anything? I think, madam, the screen is not getting shared. So I will check it. Yeah, please. Step up, everyone. yeah so um sorry so as i was saying the experience with uh, covid has been very uh, unique for us because we have been in the field uh, right from the beginning last year as soon as covid uh, symptoms had come up and the covid pandemic was Are you able to share the screen? It was so marked. Malikau had a death rate of over fifty-five per day, and a doubling rate, and a doubling rate of almost two days. And I think we were the first volunteers in Malikau when everyone that was called were running away. It was the Motiwala Homeopathic Medical College that were the volunteers, and the uh, and the commissioner, uh, Mr. Deepak Kasar, was surprised that how come we are having volunteers coming to. work for covid and we were there for 10 days we stayed in malaga 
And after that, we worked with the citizens of Malegao. Then we went on to uh, the quarantine centers, then the COVID hospitals. And when we came back with our experience, we started our own COVID hospital for tertiary care. <clears throat> so uh, with all this experience that we gathered, I requested uh, Bhagal sir when he asked me to speak, I said, let me speak on the practical aspects of managing uh, this uh, COVID uh, with homeopathy and what we have learned over here. I'm waiting for the screen to come on. I think there is a difficulty from both the sides. Uh, yes, I think uh, now we have it over here. Hmm? They bring it from there. Right? Okay, so we have the stream here. Can we go? Uh... Please, Max, and Yes, yes, I think now I've got it. Uh... So wonderful. So you see this, uh, the second wave. Uh, you know, we in fact don't believe to call it just the second wave. We call it a different COVID altogether. This strain is manifesting in many different ways than what the previous strain had manifested. Uh, what we are seeing now is... Uh, a much more aggressive uh, COVID-19. So I would not mind calling it COVID-20 then. But uh, let us continue with what uh, the world is calling it. Next. <clears throat> so uh, friends, uh, yes, being a teacher, being your uh, teacher, I would request that everyone take notes. And I had a wonderful time taking notes with Dr. Manish Inandar and uh, uh, Srirat sir also, and yesterday also I had wonderful notes that I could collect. And this is very important. So this humble request to all students that whenever you are attending a class or a lecture, don't stop taking notes. It may be in your mobile or it may be allowed or then into the uh, notebooks. <clears throat> so yesterday we saw wonderful uh, speakers and today also we had instead of Dr. Geeta Nataraj, we had Srirat sir who again spoke and uh, Dr. Manish Namdar did an excellent job with uh, the clinical syndrome and in fact I got a lot of learning myself and I took down notes in which I'm going to refer to when I'm going to talk about the remedies that we are going to uh, be discussing today. So we go on. <clears throat> so we had a number of learnings. We are just, I'm trying to just summarize what we had gone through yesterday. Uh, right from statistics coming from Dr. Kohli to uh, how we uh, drone the uh, PPE kit and uh, the awareness about the disease, the precautions and the safety measures, its spread and transmission and tracking. All these things have been discussed wonderfully with today's uh, lectures on the, the diagnosis part. Investigation is a very big issue now. There are so many different ways of investigation. The most reliable, of course, is the PCR, the RT-PCR test, and the HRCT that is being done very much. But along with that, the cytokine storm investigation is a very important part for us as homeopaths to know when to stop, to know when to refer, to know when uh, at all time we should, of course, uh, be with our colleagues of the allopathic science, but there is a time when uh, we have to become more cautious. So the cytokine storm, which I will be talking about a little more uh, later. <clears throat> so uh, this was a small pamphlet we had made on COVID care and the concerns of this. And the friends we see there are different variants. They talk about over 22 variants. And that is why there is different manifestations. And the manifestations range uh, the easy one is the fever and the respiratory distress, and immediately uh, you can uh, get aware that this is something towards COVID-19. But along with that, we are noticing different symptoms of which like loss of taste or perversion of the taste is an important thing. We have headache and body pain and fatigue, which many people complain of. We have coriza that comes up. So any of these things should make us aware that our patient, our friend, our relative is manifesting the signs of COVID-like illness, as I have started calling it. 
So uh, very commonly, very commonly speaking, we have these nine common symptoms. And I have made a very simple rule. Three of them, if out of this nine is there, we know he is in a mild state and we should become aware of the severity or the intensity of any of these symptoms would again point to the seriousness of our uh, patient or the person who has come to us. So depending on this, if you can just note down these nine symptoms, and of course they can be elaborated into much bigger terms, fever above 100 degrees. Sudden fever, that is a very specific thing of uh, viral. Viral fevers come on very suddenly. Cough bouts lasting for more than 30 seconds. When you see a patient having a, a continuous bout of more than 30 seconds, and especially as he has put his hand over here, he goes, his hands go to the lungs, or he feels the pain in the lungs. That is when you become aware that this is something serious. The toxicity on the face is very evident many times in COVID. So these are observations that one need to do. When you come to the dyspnea part, I have a very clear understanding. The person has difficulty by inspiring. So when you tell the person to inspire, he, he tends to stop when going in. And that is very typical of COVID. So friends immediately become aware when you see such a situation, you ask the person to take in air. And if it is going in easily, holding it and then coming out easily, that's fine. But you will find him when breathing, when going in, he finds it difficult. Throat pain, a very common symptom, something that should put the lights on. And this throat pain is not only a pricking pain, it could be an uneasiness, it could be hoarseness. You know, so anything, uh, we know that the, uh, the virus first goes and makes its home in the throat. And uh, we have a very clear understanding that only when we uh, suppress the fever, uh, maybe my uh, friends in the allopathic science would not be very happy with what I'm going to say, but when we have suppressed the fever with antipathic medicines, we find the viruses are most happy at that time. So in homeopathy, uh, we know right from the time of Dr. Burnett in 1906, he had advocated that fever, as I'm going to say it again, is not your enemy, it is your friend. But of course, it can cause you danger. Of course, if it goes beyond a certain limit, it is bad. I agree with that. But do not fight the fever. Weakness, tiredness, and body fatigue. I won't repeat, cold and pariza, loss of taste and smell. The appetite is lost. The person feels uh, there are so many humorous videos of the husband saying, Jevna chau nahi hai. The wife says, phones up the COVID center, and he's taken away. So they are, they are very interesting, they are very interesting uh, videos, but they have a lot to teach you. Headache and giddiness, very common symptom. We see it most of the patients or every patient at some stage or other talks about headache, repeated headache, continuous headache. And yes, giddiness is very common, especially when they get up from sleep. If they have had a small nap or something, they say, as soon as I get up, I feel the giddiness. And what are the remedies? Yes, we have very simple remedies, and I'm going to talk about that. Diarrhea is one of the very important manifestations, as uh, Dr. Inanda also pointed out to all these symptoms and explained the pathophysiology also of these complaints. So I will not go into further details of this. Yes. <clears throat> now, when the patients come with this, I'm going to one first part of my treatment. And this is something that uh, out of experience of more than 16 months, we have come up with this. And I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, the Central Council for Research in Homeopathy in the very initial days advocated the use of arsenic album 30. And it became an internationally accepted word, internationally accepted remedy. I think uh, in all the last 200 years, we must not have sold as much arsenic album 30 we sold in the last one year or so. And so uh, we went with that and we got excellent results. Uh, we used arsenic album 30 uh, throughout our program uh, last year as an uh, immunobooster, cannot call it prophylaxis. We are prevented from doing that. 
and uh, I don't do that now, but it was an immunobooster. Friends, one very interesting thing about arsenic album 30, the use of arsenic album 30 that I learned last year was that arsenic album, if taken early in the morning on an empty stomach, and after that, you take a small nap of one hour. The repose of mind, you know, we know we talk about uh, Nux vomicum, working best when there is repose of mind. So I found this uh, to be a very effective way. And I will tell you why I found that. We were in Malegao when we did the first distribution of uh, Arsenicum album. There we distributed over 400,000 bottles of arsenicum album in Malegao. And while we were doing this, while we were doing this, we found that it was the time of Ramadan. And in the time of Ramadan, the Muslim friends would take it early in the morning at the time of Shari and then go off to sleep. And I tell you, uh, we had, when we went to Malegao on the 14th of May, we had made a uh, slogan and we had said, COVID se vihai, Eid ki badhai. And friends, uh, that is exactly what happened. On the 25th of May, uh, the commissioner opened Malaga. That was the day of Eid. So I, f I thought, what was it so specific about the arsenic album working? And this is one hint I have come up with. So I'm sharing it with you. Those who would like to use it are welcome to use it. Those who would like to oppose it, Please, I also would uh, join you. Then we come to uh, this COVID kit comprised of A, B, C, and D. So uh, here uh, we are talking about the fever. In case of fever, in our observation, we have found fever to be more of a friend than your foe. It is not the disease, but your defense against the disease. Of course, any fever above 103, immediately consult your physician. But up to that time, we have D in our homeopathic kit. And that D, I'm going to tell you, it is not Dalcamera or Drosera. It is Calcarea Carb 200. Sorry, it's not mentioned over here. Uh, it is Calcarea Carb 200. And if the fever is high, you repeat it every 15 minutes. And friends, it's so effective. In any kind of viral fevers, Calcarea Carb 200, I'm specifically mentioning the potency. And so use that every 15 minutes, every half an hour, as it gets better, one hourly, and you will find the fever coming down to a controllable level of 100. And this fever we have seen persists maybe from 48 to 72 hours. Of course, the, the antipathy treatment advises you to immediately use a paracetamol or dolo, dolo or whatever else. In homeopathy, we advise the use of Calcarea Carb 200. If the fever is high, immediately see your physician and do whatever he advises you to do. Now, one more important thing that we have seen when the first symptoms are there, the patient, you know, in India, we have a culture, not India, everywhere, they have a culture of having bath every day. But when we have the initial symptoms of COVID, like illness, please stop the bath. <clears throat> so this slide has come out of the way a little, I'm sorry, uh, because the di we have completed the diagnosis and investigations, diagnosis and prognosis, different investigations required. So this was just to uh, go back onto it. Now the OPD management, of course, there is no OPD management. We say if he is positive, either he goes to the isolation, home isolation, or uh, go to the COVID center immediately. Yes, that is what you have to do. But in homeopathy, along with this, if he is a relative, if he is your patient, he has been a person well known to you and he has come to you as a homeopath, please, I suggest the use of A, B, C. A is arsenicum album 200. That is what was advised by Central Council of Homeopathy that once the COVID positive, we use arsenic album 200. This year we have added to that Bryonia 200. And Bryonia 200, you all know wonderfully that it is a wonderful uh, remedy for the lungs. 
and it works very well on the lungs as well as the heart. So both of them are covered in uh, bryonia very well. The symptoms all cover bryonia excellently. Even last year, we have used bryonia in large extent in all type of respiratory distress of COVID. And this year also, I have suggested the use of uh, bryonia 200. And even in the pathological involvement of the lungs, we have even used 6C. I'm sorry, it's not written over here, but uh, that's why I, in the beginning, I had asked you to go for your notes. And uh, so uh, 6C is important. And again, in this strain of the virus, friends, we have noticed oxygen saturation falls suddenly. There is a, the oxygen saturation may fall. You know, the patient is fine in the morning. In the afternoon, you get a phone call, the saturation has dropped. That is why we have also added to our COVID kit, Carbo Wedge 30. I know there would be a lot of opposition to me saying three remedies. There are very wonderful homeopaths uh, who talk about one remedy at a time. I'm talking about practically what we have done and what we are doing and with excellent results. So I felt I should share it. Many people told, why are you sharing your secret of ABC? Because I know of people who are selling this kit at a very high rate. We are not here for money. We are not here for anything. I want everyone to know. I want the students to know that this is a wonderful thing you can do in the initial stages. Instead of leaving the patient, you know, where there are no oxygen beds available, no hospital space available, and you don't raise your hand that I can't do anything. We have done it with excellent results. I want to share it with you. So the third one, C, is carbo wedge. Again, I repeat, is for the saturation that is falling. And I tell you, friends, uh, immediate repetition of carbo wedge half hourly or one hourly, and then go on reducing it definitely. As the symptoms reduce, reduce the medicine. And we will discuss more about that in the coming slides. So carbo wedge is a good friend of yours when the saturation is falling. Bryonia is your excellent friend when you have involvement of the lungs, where there is cough, there is pain in the chest, there is discomfort in the chest. Many more remedies are there. I will be discussing, but A, B, C. Arsenic, argon 200, Bryonia 200 and Carbo Wedge 30. And then comes D, which is for the fever. You don't need to use it unless the fever is there. And that is Calcarea Carb 200. Repeat it every 15 minutes, increase it to half an hour, increase it to one hour, increase it to four times a day as and as the fever gets uh, subsides, the patient gets comfortable, reduce it definitely. So that is an important thing about the COVID kit I wanted to talk to you. Scope of homeopathic medicines and their indications will be coming up soon. I'm going, I think, a little fast. I hope I'm okay with the speed, uh, uh, Dr. Dipranjali. Is it uh, everyone fine with that? No complaints coming in, I hope. Yes, then we go to the next slide. So management parameters for asymptomatic but RT-PCR positive persons. Friends, this is very important. I wanted to discuss this and I'm discussing this with everybody. The moment you find a person in one family becoming positive, we need to realize that he has become positive because he has been infected five to six days behind him. And during this five to six days behind him, he must have also spread it or infected his other friends and definitely the relatives in the house. So this is very, very, very important that when we see one person becoming positive, you should light up. You should immediately as a family physician, the true word for us is a family physician. You even give the ABC protocol to all the other members in the family. His colleagues, people whom he has been working with closely, do it immediately. A, B, C protocol in which arsenic on album 200 two times a day, we have usually say four times also, bryonia four times a day, carbo four times a day, all this for five days. So you will be able to break the chain. Now we see today the husband is positive, 
Three days later, the wife is positive. Two days later after that, another, the children get positive. The mother gets positive. And then the number goes on increasing. But this could have been cut if we would have started the ABC protocol or whatever the other system of medicine would like to start. But I, as a homeopath, immediately start the ABC protocol with everyone that he has come in contact with because our medicines are safe. Our medicines are safe even for even in pregnancy, they are safe. Please do not go by the term, the name of the medicines. The name of the medicines may, like arsenic album, may sound very frightening, but don't forget it, they are dynamized. They are potentized drugs and they are very safe. So when the management of parameters of asymptomatic people, in, when the, but the RTC, PCR is positive, we do not wait for symptoms to come. We start with the Now, uh, before I go with my list of the medicines that I want to share with you all, I've got some tips that we have learned by being in the field. We are working with the patients. I remember in the quarantine center, when I went and took the hand to take the pulse of a patient, everyone was surprised. But the most important thing was to remove the fear, to build the confidence. The patient feels like an untouchable if you have seen in the hospitals. And I tell you, Arsenicum album gives us good protection. We may use the shield, we may use the mask, but please do not shirk away from the patient. Now the first thing, again, I can we come to it, fever, its significance, the types of fever and the fever management. Now, calcarea carb is not the only remedy that is the end of the fever. We sometimes have fever with chills. We sometimes have fever with uh, evening rise of temperature. So uh, we have, you know, even it has been diagnosed that there are typhoid-like fever or dengue-like fever in this COVID. So the remedies change over there. So in those cases, I will be talking very shortly about what to do. But the most important thing, again, I repeat over your tip, uh, one is do not suppress the fever unless and until it goes beyond 103, do not suppress it. I'm open to criticism by my allopathic brethren, but this is my observation and none of my patients, we have treated over a thousand patients in the hospital and we, along with the allopathic doctors, of course, we have a wonderful Dr. Sandeep Patil who works with us. And uh, then the patients who are at home, who have had fever, and have treated them with the excellent results. Tip two, consider the whole family and the friends of the patient. I've just spoken about this, so please take this very seriously. Not only the person who has become positive, but everyone connected with him in the last five to six days, they all should be considered and taken care of. Tip three, yes, this is, Friends, this is the most important part. Give assurance, give confidence, give motivation. When you see the patient and you start to finish, the patient is destroyed. The moment you see the patient, hey, oh my God, finish. He's already in enough fear. I yesterday was seeing a patient and this person, we did uh, an RT, uh, RAT test. And he was nicely talking in the moment, you know, the investigation, the lab, lab person showed that uh, this is a uh, positive what day. The moment he said that this patient slumped like this. This is exactly what is happening, friends. We don't want to do that. Even if you think it is bad, assurance is very, very important. You look at the, this and say, ah, great. It is better than morning. What day? I mean, you know, we had a wonderful, uh, by the government of Maharashtra had organized a wonderful seminar. And one of the speakers, uh, I'm not getting his name, he spoke about the ethics in uh, COVID times. And the whole ethics uh, formula has changed now. So in that change, I would not mind making this one part. You can lie to the patient. Maybe go and tell what you want to tell to the relatives. But don't tell the patient, oh, this is the, you're a gone case. And he will be a gone case. 
you will see anxiety, you will see fear, and we'll talk about those medicines. The face tells you whether this is anxiety or the face tells you whether it is fear. For us as homeopaths, both the remedies are different. And we have to treat this in the best way possible. So a day in and then uh, the, the media is full of fear. So people are so scared that even now, I think uh, there'll be a time people will stop talking on the phone. That can it spread through the phone? And I won't be surprised with that also. So that was tip three. Please assure your patient, be confident of them. Uh, I talk about Germanic new medicine. Uh, I have uh, been very interested in German new medicine of Dr. Uh, Hammer. And the German new medicine says that any kind of fear settles in the lungs. So true. A patient is doing well. The moment the fear comes that he's positive, you will start seeing him develop in the lung symptoms. So German new medicine says the conflict of fear settles in the lungs and it is it has been proved time and beyond this time. So I just, uh, you might be thinking, what is this German new medicine? And then we uh, go to tip four. Yes, Dr. Hahnemann in his first edition of Organon wrote this small poem. Truth we mortals need us blessed to make and keep. The all wise slightly covered over, but did not bury deep. Every disease, every test, every difficulties in our lives comes with a solution. And this also has come with a solution many a times I tell my patients the fear, the fever is one of the solutions. And the other is self-confidence. This is when the patient says this, you know he's going to come up. And I have experienced this with many of the patients. So what I want to say is the treatment is there. Don't consider it as incurable. Let the patient know that there is nothing to worry. You be confident, you support the medicines, and you will be fine. That was very important. I wanted to point out that we also, as doctors, we should not run away from our patients. We need to stand and we need to fight for them. Five. Yes, this I have already repeated, and we have seen a number of our cases getting spoiled because of this. We have a tradition that we have to have bath in the morning. And I remember, you know, when I was in uh, college life, school life, there was a wonderful joke. And in the joke, it said uh, that a patient comes to the doctor, a very big, very a big specialist. And then the doctor says, oh, you have this fever and you have this cough, so you better go and take a bath. And he said, no, doctor, if I take a bath, I will get pneumonia. And he says, yes, I'm a pneumonia specialist. So this is what they have been telling, that if you have a bath, when you have fever and cough, you will get pneumonia. So first thing you have to do, tell your patient, is stop the bath. Even after they have recovered and they are going home, please advise them to hold on the bath for another four to seven days. But they may go on and do the warm water sponging. You may keep yourself clean. I don't say don't keep yourself clean. But direct pouring of water could uh, harm you. And these are very simple tips. People may be surprised that in such a scientific, but this is what we are observing. So please make this an important note with you. Yes. Tip six. Yes, we have heard so much about steam inhalation. I also encourage it very much. Everyone encourages it. Ayurveda has done wonderful encouragement on this. Ayurveda has suggested some herbs to be used. And I also suggest the use of these herbs even a simple thing like tulsi, which is in every home, you put the tulsi in there. Of course, for us as homeopaths, we cannot allow the use of camphor or anything based with camphor because we know it antidotes our medicines. So please avoid the use of camphor in any kind of steam inhalation. But otherwise, steam inhalation should be encouraged at least two times to three times in a day. And take in with the mouth, remove it from the nose, take in with the nose, remove it from the mouth. These are all there on the WhatsApp. So we need not repeat that there are so many wonderful suggestions coming up. And then the tip seven. Tip seven is uh, the use of turmeric. 
I'm I'm a big fan of this, and I'm I, I have my own recipe, and I always say that the the turmeric has to be sautéed with the ghee. Oh, I'm running out of time. Uh, with ghee, and then only you pour the milk, and then you cook it. So that is very important. Turmeric putting raw in milk or water or anything is not effective, is what Ayurveda says. Ayurveda says there has to be a sanskar on turmeric to activate it. Yes. Yeah, that's done with the tips. And now I go to the remedies. And I think I will be over in uh, right time. Dr. Dipanjali can relax. Uh, we'll go to what to give, when to give, and how to give. So friends, I give this list of medicines also to the uh, patients who are on homeopathy. And uh, so they can have them uh, handy with them. And you as uh, caretakers of COVID, along with the, in your in the, uh, hospitals that you're working with, if they allow you, uh, please uh, explain to the doctors that they can go along with allopathic medicines or Ayurvedic medicines. Homeopathic medicines are not disturbed and the allopathic medicines are also not disturbed by us, nor we are disturbed by them. So these medicines can be used conjointly also as a complementary or an alternative therapy. Yes. <clears throat> so friends, uh, there is a list of about 26 to 27 remedies that we commonly have used. And the, uh, the potencies are important over here. So uh, please note the potencies also. So I found Podophyllum to be our best friend in loose motions along with Naxvamika, uh, which will be coming up later on. But Podophyllum we have started with because this was one of the most common symptoms that people presented with in the initial days of this strain. Then uh, Bryonia, our best friend, 200 and also 6C. So Bryonia, the mouth coughed with dyspnea, pain in the chest, the discomfort in the chest. Then it is not a Matriya Medica lecture. So I'm not going to go into all the modalities and all, but I'm going to go to the remedy that I have used directly with these few symptoms. And uh, you find wonderful results with Bryonia. Bryonia 6C comes in when there is more of pathology. So 6C also bears good repetition. Bryonia 200 also bears good repetition. Uh, if the cough is very bad, half hourly, one hourly, and then if it is all in control, four times a day for a few days, maybe two days or three days at the most. Naxvamika is a great friend of your GIT. Naxvamika has been excellently well in giddiness. Uh, you know, when the patients, especially I've seen the, all the patients that have re, uh, got relieved with Naxvamika, when they lie down and they get up after a short sleep or something, they have this complaint of giddiness. Also, Naxvamika takes care of a lot of the GIT complaints that my friend, uh, Dr. Manish, spoke about, and it's uh, very effective there. Eupatorium perfolatum, I think I have to run. Eupatorium perfolatum is a wonderful remedy for the body ache. And I tell you, friends, only one single dose of Eupatorium perfolatum is enough for the fatigue. Rustox, body pain, wonderful remedy. Please do use it. Natrum muraticum, most of the headaches, maybe even 70 to 80% of the headaches are relieved with natrum muraticum 1M. I, I mentioned 1M over here very specifically. Even the loss of taste re uh, gets relieved with natrum or 1M. The perversion of the taste and smell is taken care of natrum or. But sometimes there have been a few cases, about eight cases in which I have had to use hydrastis uh, 30. And in one case, even the hydrastis I had to use in the millisimal potency. Gelsinium, as is written over there, running rose coriza, excellent. Arsenicum album, when the COVID-like uh, symptoms are present, if the COVID is positive, it is 200. Before that, if it is just for a uh, immuno booster, it is 30. Yes, next. Chininum ars is when the fever is there, not relieved by calcarea carb, but there is a lot of prostration, tiredness, weakness, along with the fever, it is chininum ars. Chininum self, when there is marked periodicity. Every evening after four o'clock, if the fever starts coming, chininum self is your remedy. Please note the potencies. This is what I have been using with excellent results. 
Pyrogenum, when calcarea carp fails, he is your friend. One nosode comes in as an intercurrent. A single dose, don't repeat it, and go back to calcarea carb or chininum self or chininum ars, and that should do your job. Argentum metallicum, a wonderful friend again, for dryness of the throat and cough. This Argentum metallicum we are using once the person is coming out of COVID. And a very typical thing about Argentum metallicum is cough while talking. And this is the remedy. Just give it and be rest assured it's going to work. China officinalis, we all know very well, one of our best convalescent medicines in the healing phase post COVID, this is one of your best friends. Mark weakness and tired feeling. Um, Anita Madam is also going to come in after this and uh, I'm sure she's going to talk about some of these remedies. Argentum nitricum, again, is uh, uh, one of the best remedies you have to use for any beginning of throat complaints. Argentum nitricum 200, when there is anxiety, when there is anxiousness, when you see it on the face, the patient, and when there is fear, I am using Econite 1M. I have missed to put it in this list. Econite 1000, one single dose, and this fear and this patient says, meet the marna, I am going to die. That is your Aconite 1M and it has worked excellently over here. Lachesis, again 1M I'm saying, but a single dose. Do not repeat Lachesis 1M. You don't need to repeat it. Once Argentum nitricum is not given the desired result, Lachesis is your remedy. In Lachesis, the pain is very severe, cannot even swallow liquids. So these are the things in our Matria Medica but Lachesis 1M will have to be part of your kit. Hyparself when there is phlegm in the throat. Next. One way I'm looking at the watch and the other I'm looking at my screen. And then friends, we have got uh, spongia toaster. We know a cough, constant bout of cough. A spasmodic cough lasting for more than 30 seconds. Simple hints I'm giving you friends. And this is what we do. You don't have time to go and question. The patient is not interested in going into your uh, case taking and all, he is in trouble, solve his trouble. Spongia tosta is your remedy. Dalcamara, Del cough with expectoration, loose cough like entim tart. I have missed entim tart over here, but one of our most important remedies when there is a rattling in the chest, when there you can feel the mucus is soft, is loose in the chest. Do not miss antimonium tartaricum over here. The potency I suggest is 200. Drosera, single dose. Bouts of coughing, patients sounding like TB, lot of toxicity. Again, Drosera, we have been advised and I have seen it. We don't need to repeat Drosera. Muratic acid, do not forget muratic acid in the convalescent phase. It is the best remedy that you should give after the patient has come out of COVID. The tiredness, the exhaustion, all these complaints of uh, Post-COVID, muratic acid is giving us excellent results. We have bottles and bottles made and kept for those patients. Carbovage, drop in oxygen saturation, part of my ABC kit, uh, the COVID kit of our medicine. Espidosperma now is doing the rounds, not available in the shops. And we have been using Espidosperma with very good results. The mother tincture, if the case is bad, 25 drops in one spoon of water, three times a day, four times a day, and then reduce it as soon as the patient is better. Aspidosperma, again, 30, where air hunger is marked. And lastly, I think it is phosphorus 200. Phosphorus 200, the nausea, vomiting, loose motion, the weakness, phosphorus will not fail you. Nausea, vomiting, if your patient is having, on seeing food, on eating food, just like a colchicum, phosphorus is your best friend in this kind of illness. It also takes care of the liver and stimulates your GIT as well. Next. So this is the ABCD. I'm giving this kit to my patients uh, and I tell them to keep this at hand. So you can have a click of this. Next. So when to change, we know that if the remedy is working, and has worked, you do not change medicine, you stop the medicine and wait and give it time to act. So the rules of homeopathy apply over here. And uh, 
I don't want to repeat them. Next. Oh, I missed out on a very big topic on oxygen management. Uh, and I don't think I have time, but we'll just pass through it. I had, uh, so we know we have got pranayam, chest physiotherapy and deep breathing as natural sources, next. And then the mechanical source, sources are the oxygen concentrators, the CPAP, the oxygen cylinder, small and jumbo, oxygen supply in beds, the BPAP machines and the ventilator. CPAP is a continuous positive airway pressure and BPAP is bi-level. The inner ingoing air it is, is at a different pressure and the outcoming air is at a different pressure. So it is called a bi-level positive airway pressure machines. And then we have the ventilators. And then how does oxygen, I think we skip this slide. And uh, so uh, when do we start oxygen support? Oxygen support must be once the saturation falls to 88% or below, 94% usually it was last time, but now the recommendation is up to 88%. The next indication or more important is the HRCT scan and the score, which has already been discussed with, I will not uh, repeat it. And we know that the options available are the nasal prong, where there are two uh, small pipes going into the nose, the facial mask. More than that is the NRBM, that is the non-repeater breathing mask. And then we need a CPAP or a BiPAP. Both have different uh, indications. And lastly, the ventilator. When do I withdraw? I withdraw uh, the, if, uh, from BPAP to uh, NRBM, from NRBM to nasal prong, and from nasal prong, you keep him off oxygen and observe him and then allow him to go home. I'm sorry, I can, uh, I, if you can take a click, it is very explanatory. I have tried to put it in the best way possible. Yes. So friends, it is time, uh, it is a different, this time it is deadlier, but don't scare your patient with this. This is for you. Be swifter, be smarter, be stronger. That is very important, swifter, smarter, stronger, the three S's in this COVID-19. This is my note to you all. And uh, next. So thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you, friends. It was, uh, thank you for the opportunity to Maharashtra University of Health Sciences and my dear friend, the Dean of Homeopathy, Dr. Bagel, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I hope I have been able to fulfill uh, the job given to me. If I have been short, I would not mind coming again. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much, sir, for the excellent presentation on management of COVID cases in asymptomatic cases and in mild cases. You have recommended and very well explained the various homeopathic remedy available for the treatment of COVID. So use of arsenic album, when we start the album, these tablets, when we start the treatment, how we start it, and when we stop, stop it, when we change the medicine. Then important part is role of oxygen. So you have covered this, what, what is CPAP, BiPAP, role of ventilators in management of COVID. Then you assurance, you confidence, and you motivation to patient is very important in management of COVID. So this is very important part, sir. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. And you are available for this session. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, I just have a question for you. Sure. Uh, I would like to know about your uh, experience in Maligam, as you said. Uh, where you went and uh, volunteered for your services. Uh, can you tell me whether uh, your medicines and the kit that you used, what was its uh, response like, you know, in which patients you specifically had, uh, what, what is your study observation with the use of that? Yeah, uh, Madam, uh, in Malaga, it was last year. This year we went back, but there were not many cases. We didn't have to use the COVID kit. We only used arsenic and okay. over there. And okay. uh, the Central Council of Research in Homeopathy uh, on the 28th of January 2020, as soon as the pandemic broke out, they made a study of the cases and the symptomatology in Italy, in Iran, and in Wuhan. 
And based on that study, they found a symptom similarity to be arsenicum album 30. And we went with the Central Council for Research in Homeopathy. We worked with them under their continuous guidance. And we believe, uh, even the commissioner of Malegao has time and again said that it was the major role at that time was only homeopathy. The only people in the field at that time when Malega was bad in that field was home. Of course, the allopathic friends were doing an excellent job taking care of the hospitals and the quarantine centers. But we were out in the public. And uh, so arsenicum album has a symptom similarity. And when you have a symptom similarity, it is like a vaccine. You know, the action is very similar to that of a vaccine. Maybe it may not show it to the, all the parameters that we have now. Uh, that we have at present, maybe in the future it would come up. But that is how the homeopathic medicines work and uh, the symptom similarity and that is how it helped. And there was a, a study which did not come out very much, but which proved that in Malegao, after we came out uh, on the 25th of uh, May, we came out of Malegao and three, four days later when they did a test over there, they had found that there was antibodies in more than 80% of a few number that they have tested. And uh, that test has, uh, I mean, some people like you must be aware of it also. But that was a wonderful thing that happened. Thank you very much, sir. Your experience was really uh, informative for all of us. And best wishes to you for your future also, whatever you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your excellent social work at uh, Malegao. In addition to that, lastly, uh, I forgot to mention, sir, your uh, PowerPoint slides are very excellent. It definitely increases, allows the interest for all participants. So thank you very much for preparing such an excellent PowerPoint slide. We'll put, it, we'll put it on our website so anyone can take it from there. If anyone needs it, uh, I'll keep it on the website of the Motiwala Homeopathic Medical College so people can always refer to it or even can okay. do. I'll do that. Now. Thank you, sir. And lastly, I request to all students, in addition to this management pro protocol, I request all students to please follow the task force guidelines published by the government of Maharashtra time to time for management of COVID cases. Okay. So thank you very much, sir, and have a nice day. For the last part of today's session, that is post-COVID COVID management, I would like to request Dr. Anita Patti, ma'am. Madam is the Dean Faculty of Homeopathy Medicine at uh, Bharti Vidya Pit Pune. I welcome you, madam. Okay, over to you, madam. Dr. Anita Patti for post-COVID management. Welcome you, Patil Madam. Please share your screen. Anita Madam, please check your audio also. Madam, please open your presentation first. And we were not audible. Hello? Uh, and now you are audible. Achha. Please open the PowerPoint presentation in your desktop and then share it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Yes, madam. Screen is visible. Yes, now it is visible. Yes, madam. And you are audible also. <laughs> so I welcome you again once more, madam. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, all my colleagues, my friends, and all the students of final year of all faculties. Uh, I appreciate Maharashtra University of Health Science Nashik, who has decided to conduct orientation program on COVID-19 to orient and uh, train our final year students so that they can utilize their knowledge during this pandemic situation and serve the society, which is the biggest need of this time. And I'm sure this knowledge will definitely help them help all the students during their internship program. I feel I request all the authorities to have such kind of orientation programs frequently so that our students can get the detailed knowledge of this actual pandemic situation and what they can do and what is their role. I'm thankful to respected Dr. D.G. Bagal sir, Dean, Faculty of Homeopathy, uh, MUHS for giving us this, giving me and uh, this uh, opportunity to share my views on post COVID management. Post COVID management, see, before going to the topic, this COVID 19 infection is once again breaking havoc, that is, having the large harm in the country with cases surging every day and things looking grim at the moment. All these doctors have started to highlight something called the long COVID syndrome. Let me tell you that is no textbook has given the detail about the post COVID syndrome. This post-COVID syndrome, which is said to have a debilitating impact on patient lives. I said there is no definition as such on long COVID patient who experience post-COVID symptoms lasting over six months are known to be suffering from this condition. These patients are not just those who have had lengthy stay in their ICUs or they were hospitalized, not necessary. Those who were having the mild symptoms and moderate symptoms and have not needed the hospitalization also suffering from these lingering effects of the COVID-19. So before going to that particular uh, topic of the management, we should know this is coronavirus comprises of a large, hello. Hello. Yes, continue. yes madam, please continue. You are audible. I'm audible, na? Yeah. 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 Yes. So we should know the types of coronavirus. It is very important to understand. We should have the detailed study of this virus. So other speakers have covered this that is 229E, that is alpha coronavirus, NL63, alpha coronavirus, MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2, OC43, beta coronavirus, and HKU1 beta coronavirus. I request all the students to study the proper structure and nature of this particular virus. What is mutation? how it is related to that, how it is important when we are taking COVID-19 and when we are taking care of the post-COVID cases. So we, we, our, we should have the clear study about this particular virus and the mutation. Now this is comparison structure of coronavirus. So mapping of key mutations on the furin cleaved crystal structure of SARS-CoV-2. Spike glycoprotein, you can see the gray surface view in complex with ACE2, that is brown solid ribbon, which you can see. So RBD region shown in the green. 
so this is very important to have the clear concept about the structure of the virus and the mutation it is very important because it is related to the symptoms now this is the trend of major mutation in the spike protein which we have taken from december 2020 to march 2021 so you can see here that is in the march of 21 all type of mutations you can see in this particular slide and maybe because of this reason the maximum numbers of patient of the covid 19 we have seen in the march 2021 so i feel it is important to study the proper part of the virus mutation and it is the new trend symptoms and the old trend symptoms now all the speakers have covered this but you should know that is in old strain we were having only three symptoms that is first is the cough next is the uh, fever persistent cough and loss of smell and taste but in new strain the few symptoms added that is aches and pains diarrhea discoloration of fingers or toes sore throat conjunctivitis headache and skin rashes so we should be aware about the new presentation and which symptoms are added into that so now when we are looking at impact of covid 19 pandemic the student should aware about overall situation as everybody knows that is the first case of the covid 19 in india was reported on 30th january 2020 till date its lingering effect on all sectors economic impact agriculture tourism transport construction sector there is a educational sector educational sector full and partial lockdown mute kar do ek side lag just just a moment ha so educational impact full and partial lockdown of educational institutional affecting the students and the quality of education so we should also aware about all these post covid impact on the various sectors because when we are going to talk about the disturbances in mood and behavior so somewhere we can consider these factors in health impact the physical mental and psychological yes now coming to the post covid symptoms the british national institute for health and care excellence nic describes post covid 19 syndrome for effects that persist 12 or more weeks after the onset of the first symptom a preliminary survey by the uk office of national statistics estimated that approximately 10% of people who tested positive for sars cov 2 experience one or more symptom for longer than 12 weeks so patient may experience persistent symptom after recovering from their initial illness lingering effects of covid 19 are called as post covid symptoms and what are the other synonyms for this is a long covid post acute sequelae of sars cov 2 infection post acute sequelae of covid 19 chronic covid syndrome long haul covid and they have said that is duration more than 3 months of initial illness so these are the various synonyms of the post covid symptom now when we see what are the main post covid symptoms experienced by the uh, patients till today that is respiratory shortness of breath difficult breathing cough chest pain in cardiovascular system fast or pounding heart beat chest pain musculoskeletal joint pain muscle pain general worsen symptoms after physical or mental activities fatigue and fever psychological which is very important 
डिप्रेशन और एंगजाइटी पी टी एस डी लॉस ऑफ मेमरी एंड कॉन्सेंट्रेशन स्लीप प्रॉब्लम एंड फ्यू पेशेंट्स हैव ऑल्सो हैविंग कंप्लेन्ट्स ऑफ हेड एक डिजीनेस ऑन स्टैंडिंग yes now this slide organs involved progress and duration so this is post covid this slide you can see it uh, carefully week 2 week 1 and week 4 so this is acute covid 19 it is divided into acute covid 19 and post acute covid 19 post acute covid 19 is divided into sub acute or ongoing covid 19 or chronic post covid 19 so this is the classification of post covid 19 now in acute covid 19 the pcr test is positive and post acute covid 19 the pcr test is negative in this patient have fatigue decline in quality of life muscular weakness joint pain dyspnea cough persistent oxygen requirement is there anxiety depression sleep disturbances ptsd that is post traumatic stress disorder so this is a serious mental condition that requires treatment and it could result from the loss of loved ones which we have seen in this covid 19 ki teen teen logon ki death ek ghar mein ho gayi hai so they are suffering from lot of uh, traumatic situation and the disturbances so this is ptsd the cognitive disturbances and headache palpitation chest pain thromboembolism which is one of the important and the chronic kidney diseases and some patients have suffered from the hair loss so organ damage caused by covid 19 so we will not get all these references in any book so what are the published articles till today whoever has started the post covid opd and uh, so we have so we have the data has been taken from these sources so we should know that is which organs damage caused by covid 19 so it is mainly heart lungs and brain so we have to be very careful whenever uh, we are taking follow up for the post covid patients so when we talk about the heart imaging tests taken months after recovery from covid 19 have shown lasting damage to the heart muscle even in people who experience only mild covid 19 symptoms so i told you in the beginning only not necessary that is he he had a long stay in icu and he was very seriously ill and all so he was on ventilator so it uh, it doesn't matter here whenever we are taking into consideration organ damage caused by covid 19 so this may increase the risk of the heart failure or the other heart complications in the future lungs the type of pneumonia often uh, often associated with the covid 19 can cause long standing damage to the tiny air sacs alveoli in the lungs so the resulting scar tissue can lead to the long term breathing problems so i want to request here all the final year students that is which points you should consider so whenever you are seeing the post covid patients or whenever you are studying for the covid 19 so now the time has come that is we just cannot neglect the post covid management so we should know the details of all this thing and accordingly we have to uh, plan uh, our treatment uh, part so brain even in young people covid 19 can cause strokes seizures and gulenberry syndrome a condition that causes temporary paralysis covid 19 may also increase the risk of developing parkinson's disease and alzheimer's disease so 
which investigations we have to do, how we have to conduct the examination of that patient. We have to only prescribing medicine is not the role. So taking into consideration all these factors, we have to do the careful examination of the patient and we have to properly plan for the investigation as well. So we just cannot neglect all these things when the vital organs are involved in the post-COVID cases. So this is not only this organs, blood, there are also blood vessel problems. So COVID-19 can make blood cells more likely to clump up and form clots. Well, large clots can cause heart attacks and strokes. Everybody knows much of the heart damage caused by COVID-19 is believed to stem from very small clots that block tiny blood vessels, capillaries in the heart muscle. I have made my slides uh, self-explanatory because we, we are explaining to the final year students and it should go as easy for them. They, they just cannot refer the other things. Even if they will read these slides, they will understand. So other parts of the body affected by the blood clots include the lungs, legs, liver, kidney. COVID-19 can also weaken blood vessels and cause them to leak which contributes to potentially long-lasting problems with the liver and kidneys. Yes. Now, uh, this was the study conducted in the Rome's hospital. So, total 143 patients were enrolled in that particular study, which is published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, followed hospital patients after they were discharge. It showed 87% had at least one symptom nearly two months later and more than half still had fatigue. So this is one of the important uh, symptom which is experienced by the majority of the cases after infection of COVID-19 is the fatigue. Then shortness of breath, joint pain and chest pain and cough. So these are the symptoms which is experienced by the majority of the patients. Yes, comorbidities with the post-COVID symptoms. This is clear evidence from across the world that the leading comorbidities conditions of the people with COVID-19 includes everybody knows is a hypertension, coronary artery disease, stroke, diabetes. These conditions are often associated with aging. So the risk is higher in older people. But this literature says till today, but what we have experienced in this, that is maximum younger people is suffering or the number of uh, younger uh, generation is more in this particular uh, wave. So we should also take care of that. Now coming to the post-COVID complications. Post-COVID complications, cardiac sequelae. That is cardiac insufficiency and troponin elevation. Troponin elevation. So you should know what is troponin, okay? All students. So troponin is a type of protein found in the muscles of your heart. So when heart muscles become damaged, troponin send in the blood stream directly. So there is an increased damage to the heart, greater amount of troponin is released in the blood. So there is a troponin elevation. See carefully that is I'm saying try to understand all these basic things. So it will suggest you which investigations are important. Once you can do the investigation, the management is easy. Then there is a severe myocarditis. Neurological sequelae is a viral encephalitis, increased risk, Gulenberry syndrome, and there is a paralysis as well. Cognitive sequelae is a psychological problems and delirium. Pulmonary sequelae is a impaired lung function and pulmonary fibrosis. Other sequelae is the dysphagia, impaired salo and communication. Yes. 
the post covid complication that arises from the lengthy stay in icu so what could be the possibilities so critical illness polyneuropathy mixed sensory motor neuropathy that may lead to axonal degeneration again try to understand what is axonal degeneration which investigations are important critical illness myopathy non necrotizing diffuse myopathy with fatty degeneration fiber atrophy and fibrosis post intensive care syndrome cognitive that is memory attention visual and the psychomotor psychiatric is a anxiety depression and ptsd which i explain you right now neuromuscular is the neuropathies muscle weakness or paresis poor upper extremity and grip strength poor knee extension there is a severe fatigue low functional capacity sexual dysfunction and impaired exercise tolerance these are the post covid complication which arise from the lengthy stay in the icu yes this is one of the important thing that is psychological and social impact of the post covid long lasting mental health problems and psychological distress post traumatic stress disorder which i told you that is it needs specific treatment anxiety depression loss of memory and concentration sleep disturbances the research has highlighted the impact on psychological well being of the most exposed group including children college students and the health workers as well yes now these are the possibilities what are the common symptoms patient suffer from uh, suffer in the phase of the post covid which organs are involved uh, uh, what other possibilities are there and then we will see that is what is the management part of it so management of the post covid symptom okay so this is the scan of lung infected with corona virus showing the areas of pneumonia so we have to go for hrct and the x ray and the scan so again which organs are involved so management according to organ involvement so when we talk about the heart investigation should be done imaging test ecg 2d echo angiography management depending upon the uh, reading of that angioplasty and anti coagulant the lungs investigations imaging test ct scan and cxr management home o2 therapy for 3 months depending upon the case on the complaints in the o2 saturation then the ventilation brain investigation imaging test ct scan we have to do and we have to manage anticoagulant therapy blood is very important thromboembolism clots to hearts lungs kidneys legs blood capillaries and management is always anticoagulant and the platelet and the heparin injection others is the investigation d dimer which is a very important investigation in d dimer then scr peritin crp interleukin 6 the complications deep vein thrombosis chronic kidney injury multi system inflammatory syndrome etc and how we will manage these cases that is with dialysis anticoagulant and the thrombotic event yes now see this is we have seen that is uh, uh, what is uh, modern medicine is doing now we should understand and we should also aware of about the role of alternative medicines of homeopathy ayurveda unani siddha yoga meditation so what is the role of this so role of homeopathy in management of covid 19 complication that is some of the leading remedies for post covid complications are given i have considered two three studies and taken the data from that so they have given the gelsinium for muscular weakness dizziness mental apathy 
phosphorus debility arsenic alpha anxiety chelidonium which is a liver remedy anti tart respiration and circulation i don't want to talk much on the homeopathic remedies already uh, dr motiwala sir has explained you in detail as we consider the specific remedies as well as the remedies depending upon the totality so you have to consider as we say that is we believe in the principle of individualization and uh, we consider the totality but at the same time you should not forget about the proper part of the corona virus as well so that is what type which organs it gets involved what are the complications and which investigation we should rule out so this is my personal view that is whenever you are treating any post covid case so you have to see that particular case from all angles so you have to diagnose first what symptom he is having it is because of what what is your plan of investigations and depending upon the investigations which findings you are having and then you plan your management or the treatment part which is very very important so this is as far as homeopathic management is concerned where you can think about the constitutional remedies you can think about the specific remedies it is okay because we believe in the principle of individualization and every case is unique for us because we believe in individualization so this is uh, my request to all uh, homeopathic student that is don't forget the investigation part and the proper diagnosis of the case whenever you are taking care of your covid patient as well as the post covid which is very important now what ayurveda has given the government of india ministry of health and family welfare director general of health services amr division post covid management protocol is given by them so ayush kwar then smashamani vati or bolia powder with lukewarm water ashwagandha powder amla fruit one day or amla powder muleti powder in case of dry cough lukewarm water warm milk with half tea spoon haldi in morning and evening gargling with turmeric and salt it is also suggested by the ministry of ayush that the use of chavan prash with lukewarm water or milk is highly recommended again here i request that is the proper diagnosis and proper investigation and plan so these are overall things which we can do what i can see under unani that is in unani medicine post covid complications are due to hot and dry ill temperament of the organs that is their uh, principle that is su e mizaj har wa abis that is it is written in urdu it can be corrected by moderation through certain unani principles it can be corrected by specific measures for specific complications and by achieving general measures and they have given the six essential factors so we have to study in detail what are these six essential factors is the air food and drink bodily movement and response psychic movement and response sleep and awakefulness retention and evacuation so these are the six essential factors which has been given under the unani medicine siddha recommend simple remedies to boost immunity during post covid 19 nilakai legiam that is which is made of amla and amukura churanam to overcome post recovery complications and strengthen the body and maintain good health for steam inhalation which now dr farooq wala sir has explained you the steam inhalation they have given tulsi neem leaves and the turmeric one should take an oil bath regularly to boost the immunity so these things which i have found under the siddha in physiotherapy the active cycle of breathing techniques what we call is acbt first is deep breathing then breathing control small long hop or big short hop and 
ब्रीदिंग कंट्रोल इसके पहले कहा जाता था कि हवा मुफ्त है हवा ले लो अच्छी हवा ले लो लेकिन हमें उसकी कीमत नहीं थी एंड नाउ वी आर स्ट्रगलिंग फॉर दैट एवरीबडी इज अवेयर जो मुफ्त मिलता है उसकी कीमत नहीं होती सो स्टिल टू गो फॉर प्राणायाम योगा मेडिटेशन विच इज इम्पॉर्टेंट विच इज गिवन इन द ट्रेडिशनल हमारे संस्कृति में जो दिया है सो वी शुड टेक इट वेरी सीरियसली सो दिस फिजियोथेरेपी विच इज वेरी वेरी इम्पॉर्टेंट सो यू फर्स्ट ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड कि वॉट इज दिस साइकिल ब्रीदिंग टेक्निक्स i request all these final year students that is you learn it first you become master and then you can serve the society that is what are these techniques i have not taken all the slides it is available on the net that is deep breathing breathing control small long hop big short hop and breathing control so you take a note of this point yoga which is very very important that is three part yogic breathing or ujjayi pranayam which is very important in post covid stretching are important for recovery that is asana or gentle movement coordinated with the breath this is very important so we should learn of important yoga meditation it is also important nowadays because i told you told you that many families have disturbed a lot in this situation ek ek ghar mein do do log teen teen log logon ki death ho gayi hai same time the whole family is suffering from covid 19 infection so they are suffering from the mental trauma so meditation when meditation is mastered the mind is unwearing like the flame of a lamp in a beamless place which is mentioned in bhagavad gita so we should also know the proper way to do the meditation and we should teach our patients we should explain our patient what is important of the meditation yes the post covid diet and nutrition we should also take a note of this that is high fiber diet low protein diet is required very weak you can suggest them beans dal fish eggs meat paneer not necessary to give you the details what do you mean by high fiber diet or high protein diet is required but what is my concern is that aspects that need to be kept in mind while preparing the post covid diet so what do you have to remember managing other complications if any example hypertension diabetes kidney dysfunction and cardiac involvement digestive disturbances loss of taste or loss of smell difficulty in breathing difficulty in swallowing especially those who may have been intubated during hospitalization so we have to consider all these points and then we have to plan proper plan of diet for your patient yes so we should also aware about ongoing research work and published article yes this is one of the important study tiruvananthapuram study 24th february 2021 total patients were 19953 so 84194 out of total 19953 patients were found to have post covid symptoms respiratory the percentage was 50% cardiac issues 20% patients were having and musculoskeletal symptoms and others the percentage was 
मल्टी सिस्टम इंफ्लेमेटरी सिंड्रोम हैज बीन रिपोर्टेड इन चिल्ड्रन 102 post covid clinics have been set up in addition to e sanjeevan platform or telemedicine for screening so we can take a note of this that is e sanjeevan platform is uh, created by tiruvananthapuram or uh, telemedicine for screening of the patient homeopathic post covid management center bharati vidyapeeth homeopathic hospital pune so we have started post covid opd on 15th december 2020 with the initiative to study the effect of homeopathic medicine in cases of post covid symptom we prepared our protocol the inclusion and exclusion criteria and this is an ongoing research clinical trial till today 80 patients have been enrolled in this i have prepared a graph for you that is symptom wise distribution of post covid homeopathic management again i told you that is the fatigue is experienced by maximum patients remedy wise bryony alba is mostly used in these cases then sulfur causticum carbovage restox it is okay i don't want to focus on that my main concern is that you have to plan how to give the treatment to the post covid cases which medicine we have you treat with a homeopathy you treat with ayurveda yunani siddha it's okay but we should know that is what our literature says which medicine we have what we should consider and what we should not consider so that plan has to be ready now each and everything we cannot uh, take in the presentation that's why i am requesting all the students of all the faculties that you should read properly try to understand and you get your concepts clear ki what is important so what i feel personally is that you should do the diagnosis first you should understand the importance of the lab investigation first you are vision should be clear which organs are involved what are the possibilities kya uh, serious ho sakta hai so you have you should know the thorough study of the case and then what is your plan of management so these are just drug that is what we have prescribed till today so bryonia alba the maximum prescription it's given of bryonia alba so these are the articles which is published uh yes one more thing uh, i will add into that that is most commonly prescribed remedies during this trial period was bryonia alba then sulfur causticum i told you and the most common symptom observed in our trial are fatigue symptoms and rheumatic symptoms respiratory gastric symptom and comorbidities psychosis and the diabetic symptom so this was in our study now let let me tell you that is which articles are published till today on post covid when i was searching for uh, literature uh, in the month of uh, december so i couldn't find much but now it is available the people are publishing their research article on the post covid as well so there are few these papers on management of post covid 19 in primary care attributes and predictors of long covid post discharge persistent symptoms and health related quality of life after hospitalization for covid 19 there is another paper on post discharge symptom and rehabilitation needs in survival of covid 19 infection a cross sectional evaluation paper was published there is another paper published on long covid and chronic covid syndrome so i request all the students to go through all these research articles and 
you should read this so what is conclusion of today's lecture is that in the background of this economic and educational covid 19 impact the virulence of coronavirus is still at high end and with time limitations of the corona strain the world is today confronting a deadly wave of this pandemic at our end we should keep ourselves healthy physically mentally socially and be strong enough to fight this deadly monster as survival of the fittest is the rule of nature so once again i request all the students to go through the literature read the proper part draw the diagram of corona virus try to understand what is mutation what are the newly added symptoms into that what is the reason for this recently uh, what is happening related to the mutations which labs are uh, working for that for that particular mutations every day the new information is coming in the newspaper so we should update ourselves first and we see when this uh, uh, university is mhs university is trying to orient you uh, they are trying to give you the knowledge so same time everybody has to show the interest take the interest to serve the society and get your concepts clear with the proper part and the treatment part as well so thank you very much for giving me opportunity for sharing my views with all these student it was a wonderful experience thank you thank you so much thank you very much ma'am for one more excellent presentation on post covid management so you have explained very well about post covid management in post covid management we must monitor for organ damage so most common complications that we face in post covid complication is stroke gbs post covid seizures are there and there are chances of parkinson's disease and alzheimer's disease in addition to that you have mentioned about heart failure and because of clotting the coagulopathy there are chances of myocardial infarction ischemic heart disease the most common complication most of the patients are facing admitted patients are facing that is a pulmonary fibrosis so role of physiotherapy is most important in post covid in preventing the post covid complications then the complications like polyneuropathy muscle weakness so you have mentioned each and every complication in addition to that role of the ayurveda therapy homeopathy medicines then siddha and unani medicines so they are having a most important role in post covid complications then you have updated all of us regarding lot of research which is ongoing in treatment of, in uh, post covid management so thank you very much madam and i hope it is definitely helpful to all participants who are watching this program and not only to them help of uh, practitioners who are watching this program later on as it is available on youtube also so thank you very much madam for excellent presentation thank you thank you so thank much you valuable time with us in future we expect some cooperation from you thank okay. you so much thank you chitra madam thank you dipanjali ma'am thank you so much for giving the opportunity thank you so much have a good day thank you ma'am have a good day so we are participants to summarize this two days program you must remember some points that is in covid management remember that 70 to 80% of the patients are asymptomatic and after that the categories of the patient or stages of the patient there are six stages of the patients as per task force guidelines it is mild cases which are divided into stages a b c which is followed by the moderate cases which are again classified into d and e and the severe and the critical cases are there 
so early diagnosis is very important then in separation of transmission of the disease remember three things so there is the contact spread the contact and lastly test so test press test and treat the contact thus we will prevent the separation of transmission for diagnosis of covid remember that rt pcr is the gold standard test rt pcr is the gold standard test is there then when we repeat the rt pcr when we do rt pcr if the report is positive and negative there are these two types of report are there sometimes the report is inconclusive or invalid so when the report is inconclusive or invalid at that time we must repeat the rt pcr then as per recent guidelines from the RT, uh, icmr do not repeat rt pcr in covid confirmed cases do not repeat rt pcr in covid confirmed cases for follow clinical recovery or symptomatic recovery of the patient is most important in this patient when we repeat the rt pcr when the patient is symptomatic but the rapid antigen test is negative so remember that when the patient is symptomatic rapid antigen test is negative in that case we repeat the rt pcr then as yesterday dr rupak devadiya gaus have mentioned that in the presentation hanneman statement that is universal vaccination put an end to all epidemic so role of vaccination is very important and as a health professional all of you motivate and encourage the patient uh, encourage all people about 100% vaccination then in the management protocol dr kohli sir and dr uh, motwala sir mentioned about various ayurvedic and homeopathic medicine that is use of ayush 64 ayush kada in addition to that in detail dr motiwala sir mentioned about use of various homeopathic remedy that is use of arsenic album and other uh, remedy you must remember that and you must remember uh, use that in your practice in addition to that the task force guidelines of the maharashtra government in the management of covid that is in mind to uh, moderate cases role of high calorie diet is very important high calorie diet then adequate fluid therapy in addition to that when we start oxygen use of oxygen by using nasal prongs in addition to that management of hypo uh, hypoxia we must administer antiviral drugs so when we start the avi flu when we start the remdesivir then use of steroids so initially we start with the dexamethasone then along with remdesivir we use the methylprednisolone and in severe cases we use the hydrocortisone so in addition to that use of antithrombotics like low molecular weight heparin as in the last lecture madam mentioned that in post covid complications because of the blood clots or thrombus that are acute myocardial infarction is there ischemic heart disease is there and the stroke is there so to prevent that use of thrombolytics use use of low molecular weight heparin is important and lastly there is a when we use the tocilizumab so these are the various medicines available for covid so you must follow the task force guidelines prepared by the maharashtra government time to time and lastly as a health professional i request all of you we must maintain our physical mental and social health during this covid days and coming to the last part of this program um coming to the vote of thanks i am very much thankful to honorable vice chancellor dr nitin karmalka sir sir is vice chancellor of savitri bai phule 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 university in addition to that active vice chancellor mhs nasik 
I'm very much thankful to Dr. Kalidas Chavan sir. Under their leadership and guidance, it is possible for us to organize and conduct this program. I'm very much thankful to Dr. Kuldeep Raj Kohli sir. In spite of their busy schedule, they are present here for our guidance. I'm very much thankful to all faculty deans, especially Dr. Shikhar Deshmukh sir, Dr. Dhanaji Bhattal sir, Dr. Prasar sir. Because of their time-to-time -time cooperation, we have successfully completed this program. In addition to that, I'm very much thankful to all faculties. That is Kuldeep Raj Kohli sir, Prabhakar Devadi sir, Dr. Shri Raj, Dr. Rupali, Dr. Farooq, Motiwala sir, Dr. Manisha madam, Dr. Inam Dar sir. All these faculties are busy in their institute in COVID management. Still they are available for us and they have, they have, uh, they have presented excellently all topics. So I'm very much thankful from my bottom of heart. So thank you very much, sir. In addition, I am very much thankful to all deans and principals of all affiliated colleges who encourage all participants to participate in this program. So I am very much thankful to all deans and principals of affiliated colleges. In addition to that, I am very much thankful to whole MUHS team. I am very much thankful to computer de department under the leadership of Mr. Sachin Dende and his team is for continuous support for this online program. I'm very much thankful to electricity department of MUHS, civil department of MUHS. In addition to that, I'm very much thankful to my support team, support staff of MUHS MH department. And not last, not least, but last, I'm very much thankful to all participants, to all students who are watching this program, who are attending this program since yesterday. And definitely, it is very helpful to all students. And this is the time, remember the students, this is the time in your life where the society needs us. So this is the time to prove ourselves as a doctor. We must win this war. So thank you all participants, thank you all faculty, and thank you whole MHS team. Thank you for your cooperation and support and have a nice day. Thank you all of you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear students and uh, participants, all of you who have been present throughout for the last two days. It has been a wonderful uh, academic feast where we had uh, very eminent speakers who have uh, from their busy schedule, they have allotted their uh, valuable time. Uh, really, it has been an enriching experience where they have uh, spoken about their own personal experiences from their practice as well. And uh, dear students, I would like to emphasize here that that counts a lot. Please pay attention to these small, small things which they have given uh, tips about or they have hinted at some point or the other. You have to take in that, grab in that and keep that in mind. Secondly, I would also like to say that we have uh, all participants from all over Maharashtra, which are from the interiors also, and we are very uh, happy to have them, whether it is, uh, you know, from Buldana or Akola or Garchuroli and every, all over the place rather. So with the limited resources, you will be having to do the work. And I think uh, as first contact physician, you will have a lot of responsibility on your shoulders, not only to diagnose, but to know at what point of time you have to refer your patients to the higher center. So keeping all these things in mind, uh, the speakers today and yesterday have highlighted all those things. So please keep it in mind. Secondly, I would also like to point out that uh, some uh, reports which we have been seeing uh, in the last two days where we have incidents where doctors have been deserted with the uh, results that are, they are seeing in their uh, you know day-to-day -day practice where some of them have to see maybe four to five casualties per day and they are giving up on it. So at this point of time, it is not just necessary to have that knowledge and the skill to do your work, but at the same time, as even Madam's uh, lecture was on post-COVID uh, uh, management, even there also it has been highlighted. 
that we have to be responsible for our own as well as uh, if we take our own responsibility, we'll be able to take and uh, owe to the society also and carry out our responsibility uh, in the most sincere way. It is time to reflect upon what mistakes we have done. It is not a disease that has been uh, spread just like that only. Uh, have we done any mistakes? What are the mistakes? Can we rectify them? At what level can it be rectified? Is lockdown the only answer to that? I think each one of us, if we take the responsibility of taking care of the disease, definitely it can be uh, taken, uh, I mean, the chain can be broken and we'll be able to get rid of it very fast. So let us all take that responsibility and as healthcare professionals, let us not just focus on the problem. We have a lot of material available with us, but let us focus on the solutions, which are uh, very simple also, but at the same time, implementation of those solutions is also very, very important. This uh, crisis which is going on right now has taken its toll on the economy, on the healthcare system, on uh, society as a whole, on individuals mentally and uh, socially. So let us equip ourselves, strengthen ourselves with simple measures like you know pranayam, yoga, as Madam has already said. So these simple measures where we take care of our health, but uh, at the same time take care of you know mental health also, spiritual quotient or emotional quotient, lay emphasis on that, strengthen that, and see that uh, we are uh, healthy ourselves, we take care of ourselves and others. God helps those who help themselves. So you have to first help yourself in that manner and then go out and take care of others also. And I'm sure all of you, are uh, um, really enthusiastic and uh, uh, looking forward to taking care of this particular challenge. So I thank you all and uh, wish you good luck in your future life and uh, this responsibility that you are going to take on now. I thank all the faculty, the eminent speakers, MUHS, and you know the government of Maharashtra, which has been uh, the backbone for this and uh, uh, really helpful in all respects right from the beginning. So looking forward to a better tomorrow and a better learning experience with all of you again. Uh, I, I sign off here and wish you all good luck. Thank you. God bless you.